Okay, guys, let's get into the company heroes. This is, you've now joined for boot camp. Welcome, everybody. Let's turn the tunes off so we can just clear my voice. We're going to be talking about the Soviet faction today. So if you guys are new, you'll definitely find this very helpful. Uh, I'll be going through all different things. So Soviet build order, Soviet unit, all the Soviet units in the game. Um, so first of all, but let's go through the tier structures uh, and what you start with. So this is what you normally start with in company heroes too. You start with just one engineer in your HQ building. Um, you can then either build another engineer or another conscript. But then you've got two options. You can go into tier one, which is this tent, the special rifle company. Or you can go tier two for the support company, basically. Support weapon company. Okay, so the support weapon company here brings out the MG, the mortar, and the ziz gun, which comes from over here. And then over here we have your tier one, which is so, so that's tier one, that's tier two. You don't need any tech required to actually build these straight away. Um, and you've got your Soviet sniper, penal squad, and your M3. Okay. Lexo. Right. So, and then you've also just got some conscripts out as well. So generally, uh, in Company Heroes 2, you could do a couple, a couple of uh, a few build orders like this. So one build order is to go tier one and make three penal squads. Maybe, and then you go one penal squad, M3, upgrade of once you get a flame, get a flamethrower, sit and then get inside the M3, and then go two penals. And then this is like a good standard early kind of game, your core build order for so which is very popular at the moment. This is a very common meta build that people are doing at the moment. You could also get a sniper in the in the mix here, but that will leave you a bit vulnerable because these squads are quite you know quite expensive because they cost 300 manpower and the sniper is also 360 manpower. Now the sniper can just pick away at squads at range, um, but it's very vulnerable, and uh, as soon as they get into combat, they will probably die if uh, an enemy unit can shoot shoot back at them. But the sniper can outrange uh, every infantry squad in the game, and just you know can always pick away at squads. So basically, you want to pick away at squad and then pull back with the squad and using an attack move. Okay. Now the M3 is very effective in Company Heroes um, 2 because you know the units inside the M3 don't take damage um, while uh, you know pursuing enemies uh, unless the vehicle explodes. Then there's a chance you might lose the entire squad inside, but that's very rare. But it does happen. Um, but generally, you, know, you want these three squads. Um, you know, capping, killing units. M3 needs. You know, you have the M3 harassing. You need with an M3. You got. You want to watch out for units such as. Um, the Volks Grenadiers, at, you know, not at the start of the game, I'll tell you in a second. And then you've got the Austere Grenadier. But also, you might come up against um, uh, possibly uh, Infantry Ostrupen as well as uh, Panzer Fusiliers. Right. So, in the, this, this is like the pure early game. Okay. So, in the pure early game, a Volks Grenadier squad will not be able to Faust. The, um, the M3, right? Because it requires its battle group headquarters or mechanized first. So for the first four or five minutes, you could be pretty aggressive with an M3 and start burning down um, Volks Grenadier squads or even the Stern Pioneer. Because the Stern Pioneer, as you'll see here, does not have any way to counter armored vehicles. It's got no kind of Faust, no AT crit ability, right? So that is a unit you can probably get nice up and close and personal with, with the flamethrower. But you want to make sure you've got a flamethrower inside the M3 because it does a lot of damage. Um, you know, compared to like an M3, and uh, it's good, you know, especially if it's like an MG in a building, you can rush it, you can burn it quickly, and, and you're very mobile with that. Um, so, also, uh, now going on to Austere, Austere can Panzerfaust with both the Grenadier and the Ostrupen squad, so you want to be watching out for these guys, uh, because those all, they can also, um, you know, damage the engine of this and, and wipe it, so you're going to be very careful, um, you know, always want to keep distance from these squads if you're using an M3. And also you've got the Panzer Fusilier from the OKW, which also has an AT grenade snare, which has quite got a big range. So again, watch out for them. Um, you know, they, they can do that straight away from the get-go. Um, and and uh, crit. So we've got to watch out, watch out for that when they get 25 munitions, okay? So those are the units you've got to watch out for when using an M3. And then you want to transition in with, you know, when you're up against an enemy vehicle, you then want to upgrade um, one, of the, one of your penals with a PTRS package. So let's just uh, quickly capture this territory. Um, selection, owner, me. Right. So we're going to upgrade the PTS rifle for 60 munitions. Now watch. I now have access to um, the anti-tank satchel charge, which is a sticky satchel charge. 
Uh, and also PTRS rifles. Now the PTRS rifles are good against light vehicles like uh, like um, half tracks, Panzer twos, Pumas. They will do quite quite a big amount of damage to them. Um, and also the sticky satchel is like a um, you know if, if an enemy vehicle comes into the range of that sticky satchel, it hasn't got a big throw range. But if you manage to stick it on there uh, and start throwing it, you will even be able to um, connect to it even if it gets outside the range. Okay. And that sticky satchel does a does a massive amount of damage to light vehicles. It will practically one shot like a two to two. Uh, bring down like a Panzer II down to like 70% health. Uh, I can quickly give you a demonstration of how effective this uh, this is. So, let's just have a quick look here. So I'll just quickly give you an example. So light, light vehicles, you know, you'll probably see a 2-2-2 two -two -two or a half track. Oh, turn this please. So like, this is austere vehicles. You'll probably see these austere vehicles in the early game. Possibly even this austere vehicle as well. Maybe, maybe within some, maybe with some Panzer Grenadiers as well, because that's a popular commander. Which you know, this is only commander selection with this. See this unit, um, uh, but you might see that as well. Now, if you're up against this, now the Penal Squad is really good against dealing with these guys. I wonder if I can make these neutral. Um, let's just delete this squad out of there for a second. Let's make this squad invincible. What health? Vulnerability enabled. Right. Yes. So you'll see here these vehicles. So if I love a, I can shoot this um this half track here, or I'll shoot this uh, this two to two. And you can see the PTRS rifles do quite a bit of damage every time they connect. They do about like 25% um, health each time a PTRS shot fires onto it. About, yeah, about 20% health. You see how quickly, you know, a couple of volleys so take that down. And then I can lob a sticky satchel as well onto this. Like so. That, that, that will stick onto the vehicle and then it will blow it up like so. And even one shots that vehicle. And do the same to this one over here. I don't know if it will one shot a half track, but it will bring it down incredibly low. There you go. So yeah, for, for this half track, it will bring it down to about 20% health. And then you could just, you know, if you want to just finish it off, you just like, you know, again, just... Fire on it with PTS rifles if you want to finish it off to take it down with these. Okay, so this is a unit you want to be using against light vehicles, but they're only going to be able to have that once they upgraded their 60 munition package for PTS anti tank rifles. However, against light vehicles, so against medium vehicles and above, like Panzer IVs and stuff, the PTS rifles themselves aren't going to be very effective, but the stacky stitch will still be very effective against those vehicles regardless. Okay, so that was um, kind of one type of, kind of type of build you can do in the early game for uh, for Soviets. Let's go on to the second one. So there's another build I like to do. Let's just delete these guys quickly because I'm popcats. Delete. So. We have more conscripts at our disposal. Fresh conscripts have arrived. So another build order you might want to do as, so, uh, as uh, Soviets is go with the four conscript build. So what you would want to do here is you would go conscript, 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 Molotovs. Healing, which is so Molotovs is this package here, 80 munitions, 10 fuel. And then you'd want to get the healing so you can heal your troops back at base. Now, the Molotovs are very good at uh, doing area of effect damage units behind cover, and it's a good way to deny cover. So, let's say there's an enemy grenadier hiding behind this hay barrel. I wanted to get him out of there. I'd love a Molotov in there for 50, 20 munitions. And then that enemy, you know, well, if he stays there, he's going to die. And, he, and if, if he moves away, that makes him vulnerable because he's no longer in cover, right? So Molotovs are very good against, you know, forcing enemies out of cover. And also against maybe, maybe set up machine guns in houses or whatever, okay? So you want to go for these conscripts, like four, about four conscripts. Still upgrade like the engineer with the flamethrower. And then if you wanted to deal with vehicles in the light game with this build, you would then want to upgrade the AT grenade. So basically, very similar to the, the sticky satchel that the, the penals with the AT rifles had, but it's a lot weaker. However, against light vehicles, this AT grenade will still damage the engine of the vehicle, as I will now demonstrate. So we'll again do the same thing. We'll, we'll bring out a um, Puma and a Panzer II this time. So again, when you're playing as OKW, the first unit you're very likely to see in terms of armor is probably this unit, the, the Panzer II, because that's like the end. That's very good against infantry. So I'll just make the this neutral. Right. So if I lob a like lo, so lob a normal gren grenade, AT grenade. 
and then it does about 20% damage, but it damages the engine of this vehicle, which makes it a lot slower. So if you had like a Ziz gun, one of these, in conjunction with that AT grenade, then you could possibly be able to wipe this, this unit. Same thing over here, an AT grenade onto a Puma will also damage its engine. However, let's let's bring on, for instance, a OKW uh, medium tank, like a Panzer IV. Owner, neutral. Now, if I was to lob an 80 grenade on a Panzer IV, while it being at maximum health, and this is the same with all medium vehicles, like Panzer IVs, Oswins, T-34s, Shermans, Cromwells, an 80 grenade, like so, will not damage its engine. However, once it gets it, once it's slightly damaged, a second dam, a second 80 grenade will get the damage engine critical onto the Panzer IV. Okay, so you want to make sure you have either two conscripts there ready to get the 80 grenade off. Or you first let your Ziz gun hit, get the first shot in to damage it a bit, and then you lob the AT grenade in to then get the critical hit, okay? Because you always want to try and aim to get your, your, enemy, your enemy vehicle's damage engine, because that makes them a lot slower and a lot more, you know, easier to pick off, okay? But let's just delete these guys, so, so that's what you want to do. So four conscripts with the healing, and then you might want to mix in, uh, maybe go in then after with like a Maximum and a Ziz gun with this build. Or support, you know, obviously the machine gun can suppress infantry, the anti-tank gun again works well with the conscripts because the AT grenades. And then also don't forget about laying mines, you know, engineers are very important, you know, in every, any faction you play guys, I'll always say this, is that mines win games. You always want to be laying mines, like a good mine spot would be here, around the corner of my, of this house. This is a flank route, so my opponent might try and come around the back here, also on this side here. Does any, any infantrymen might come down the road and try and go for my cutters off? I wouldn't want to place a mine here, for instance, because this is right outside my... Uh, you know, the, the enemy's going to come from here, and they're more likely to hit the mine on this side, or around on this side, because that's their base that exists over here, right? So they're going to come from this way down, or they're going to come from around this way to try and get my cut off. So a mine, like, about here or here would be better than putting it anywhere else. Uh, but possibly here, because they could try and flank around that side, around the back there as well. It's also advisable um, it, to maybe place a mine at your base entrance, like here or here, just in case your opponent feels a bit cocky and tries to dive your base and try and wipe one of your squads that retreated back to base. I've, I've had that quite a few times when I've, uh, and they saved me when someone's tried to chase me down. I've had a mine at the base entrance and then it's basically a bait, you know, I ret feign retreat, retreat back, he tries to go for it, mounted tank guns there, ready to kill him, he hits the mine, can't get away inside and the Ziz gun finishes it off. So, you know, and he's just lost his, his armored vehicle for nothing. Uh, and I've just, you know, and all I've invested in was just a mine, you know, a dirty munition mine. And again, like, another big point, guys, if you weren't here yesterday, mines win games. It's that they cost munitions to build mines, they're incredibly important. Always try and place as many of them as you can, unless you're trying to save up for, like, an upgrade. Um, you know, you want to upgrade, for instance, your, your penals with, with, with the upgrade package, or you want to, like, save munitions for, you know, uh, lobbing a, um, like, an artillery barrage. I'd always recommend how always having... Maybe a, a float of like 40 munitions, so that if, you know, you wanted to lob a grenade, be that a Molotov or an 80, or like a, an 80 grenade critical snare, um, you have it available. You never want to be like having like 10 munitions in the bank because then you're going to be, you know, that would hurt you because you might have had a chance to wipe a squad if you had the munitions for the mine or, uh, sorry, munitions for the, for, the, for, the, for the grenade throw, for instance, or something like that. So always have a little bit of munitions in the bank, I would recommend, okay? Now another build you can do with Soviets is uh, you could go tier two and you could go like for instance uh, I would go Maxim Maxim maybe Con Con or maybe Conscript Maxim Conscript Maxim. That's kind of a support build. This kind of a, it's not really a, an aggressive build. This is kind of more like a defensive build, but you can still make this work. This used to be like a meta a long time ago, maybe a year or two ago. But you can still make this work, I think. Um, but generally, I find that you know as as uh, in print in general. The Soviet faction is quite the, quite an aggressive faction with their units are primarily um, tail, uh, tailored to CQC, close, co close quarters combat. So both the penals, this unit, and the conscripts both excel at close quarters fighting. And they don't excel at long range fighting. However, um, some things need to be taken in, into consideration when I say that, okay? So for instance, if you're up against, um, let's break a Stern Pioneer squad. Right, we have a Stern Pioneer squad here, yeah? Now a Stern Pioneer squad is very good at close quarters combat, but it's terrible at long range combat. Therefore, if you, uh, you would want to use these units at max range versus this particular unit, because they are not, 
that bad, uh, you know, at max uh, at, at range. However, obviously they, they, they sell at close range, but in this instance, you would want to use range, your range advantage here against this unit, which is primarily only good at close quarters combat. Okay, so and the same thing, you know, as, you know, as Axis as we go through, like you know, for instance, shock troopers, um, which is an elite infantry squad that we'll get into in more detail in a minute. But again, these shock troopers are only good at close quarters combat. You do not want to have them. Charging into an enemy from range and, and you know, out, open cover because they're going to drop like a couple of models, a couple of men before they even get to the fight and actually do any damage. So, you want to make sure that, like, for instance, like a unit like this, and you know, you'd want to be creeping up towards your enemy, you know, by using cover. Now, shocks against Sturms, the shocks would win, uh, but still, like, if, if you know, the better engagement would just be let these guys just pick the, pick the Sturm Pioneer squad at range because the Sturm Pioneer will probably get take a couple of models off the shock squad. But it would still win, but you know, you always want to try and, like I say, always use the best available uh, kind of units for the job if you have them available, okay? Right. So, onto back, back onto this build. So, you've got your double conscripts, yeah, yeah, I mean, your maxims. So, what you want to do with your conscripts basically is you want to be like trying to push them forward to capture the fuel while your maxims are in the back capturing other points. So, you can, like move your maxim up to here, covering the rear. The conscript moves up to there. There'll be other conscripts over here. And then you can move in your maxims. Because, you know, support weapons take a couple of seconds to set up, right? You can see this. One, two, three, four. So it takes about three to four seconds for a maxim to set up. So you want to make sure that you've got infantry ahead of your machine guns and your support weapons before you set them up. Because you don't want a machine gun pushing forward, right? And then running straight into an enemy. Because by the time they've set up, that enemy has spotted them and either backed away behind some cover... Um, or they've or they've managed to flank the squad, okay? So you never want to be pushing forward with your machine guns first because you because you you know you'll be vulnerable like that. You always want to make sure you're you're clear, clear, um, spotting the way first with your infantry before pushing forward with uh, with your with your machine guns, okay? It's also worth noting, guys, that once your machine gun has been spotted, your opponent will then inevitably try to flank that machine gun. So. I would never keep your machine gun in one spot for too long. Because I've seen lots of new people doing it. They leave a machine gun in the middle of the map, like locking, like they would leave it, like for instance, you know, a lot of new people would be like, okay, I'm going to leave my machine gun in this house. Because it's a good house, right? It covers the middle of the map. But after like having one, after having like one engagement where you successfully repel the enemy, your opponent might then make a mortar and try and bombard you out. So in, in anticipation for that, you could be like, right, so he knows my machine gun's in that house. I'm going to reposition now and, and, and set up a second flank. So I'm going to jump out with this Maxim again. And then also try and cover the same kind of angle, potentially. But also, like, be somewhere different. So he's not expecting me in that same location again, okay? Because otherwise, you know, he'll, he'll know you're there. You'll become predictable and he can just easily deal with you. Hey, Nagano. Thank you for the host. Cheers, buddy. Right. So let's get on to the next tier structure, which is tier three. So tier three, let's double check here. Tier three costs 85 uh, fuel and the T70 is 70 fuel. So you want to be building your tier three around the time when you have around about 130, 100, 140 fuel. Because by the time you built the tier four, sorry, tier three, you will then have um, uh, access to the C70 immediately, you know, once, once it's built. And uh, that's kind of generally like nearly every Soviet player will do this. They always go T-70 first because the T-70 is the best light tank in the game. It absolutely demolishes infantry. It's not good against armor at all. Um, apart from like half tracks and the two two, uh, and the Panzer II. Um, and it'll lose like to like, like a Puma for instance. But it's very effective uh, against infantry. It's like it's literally the best light, light vehicle in the game to actually kill infantry with. But again, one, one like Panzerfaust or whatever, or, or AT Grenade Snare, will damage the engine of this vehicle because it's a light vehicle, right? So you want to make sure that you're always using, you're always kiting with this unit. So your enemy are pushing in against it and you're constantly reversing back. The T-70 has got quite a bit of range actually, right? Like so. So you want to be trying to always fire around this distance, like over here, and make sure those Volks and those Panzerfuses and those, those, those Grenadiers can't get close to you. Otherwise, they will be able to get a snare in and you'll be in trouble. Okay. What else we got? We got the half track and the SU-76. Actually, we didn't talk about the mortar quickly. Let's just talk about the mortar. So the Soviet mortar um, has a couple of abilities here. Unlike other mortars, it has the flare ability. So 
If you've got 30 munitions, you can drop a flare in the sky, which gives you um, vision of the uh, of an area. So it allows you to uh, anticipate uh, where enemy movements are happening and maybe set up an attack that you might want to. So there you go. So I've dropped a flare in the sky, like so. It's, I've put it on the ex uh, absolute range of my vision. I'm just going to delete these conscripts here so you guys can see. And we get this big circle of vision here. And uh, you can pop that anywhere, really, on the battlefield as long as you're within range. And you can see on the mini-map here the distance of the range of this this uh, this flare. And so we get, you know, it's a good way, to, you know, even in team games, to, you know, pop the flare in the sky so your team know what, what's, what, what, you know, where the enemy might be. And then, you know, you might have, um, you know, even with just a mortar, you flare the mortar, you can see the enemy position, and then you can bombard where they might be set up. And also you could do the flare in conjunction with maybe a Katusha, which can then, like, bombard also the position as well. So, and also a mortar, you know, standard uh, bombardment, Yes, sir. Is that, you know, you just press uh, Z and they'll bombard the specific position for a short amount of time. Stop. They will also, the mortar team will also uh, manually fire at enemies they see if you don't give them, an, give them an instruction. But the barrage ability will actually be slightly more effective because the rounds will come in a bit faster. Thank you very much for the follow, Ovladin. Ovladodin. Cheers, dude. And then also another good thing is the, the mortar barrage as well, the mortar smoke barrage. So if you had an enemy machine gun set up, for instance, on this bush here, pointing south, if I popped, popped in a smoke barrage down there, that MG would no longer be able to see. Um, would be able to try and camp my cutoff. So, they, or, you know, but at the moment, so the MG's there, he's stopping me coming out of my base. If I pop this smoke down, I could rush the machine gun, he'd have to force to set up and reposition, and that'd be a good time to attack. So, you know. Smoke is incredibly important company here too, so make sure you're always using smoke. Uh, right, so these are three vehicles from tier three. So as we explained, T-70 is very good against infantry. The issue 76 is a light tank destroyer. It has a fixed gun, so that means it, can, it you know, it's very slow to turn. It, if I wanted to get it to shoot over there, it has to rotate its whole body over there. So this means it can easily get flanked. So if a Puma, for instance, an OKB Puma, or even a 222 managed to get behind the, this, this unit, you'd be in trouble because it's very vulnerable from, from the side or the rear, and it has to turn. Okay, so but this unit, you want this unit trying to be, you know, firing at max range, you can have it prioritize vehicles so it doesn't shoot at infantry. And it also has a nice barrage ability, um, to, which is effective against infantry. Its main gun though, generally fight, uh, shooting, manually will not be good against infantry at all. However, you can use this unit against um, light vehicles and medium vehicles and be quite successful in, in, in dealing with them. So like even against the Panzer IV, you could use this effectively against the Panzer IV because it outranges the Panzer IV. But generally, if a Panzer IV was to come and fight this in one one-on-one -on -one battle, the Panzer IV would win. However, if you use the, its, its range advantage and make sure you're always sniping with it, then you'll be, it'll do quite well for you. So this barrage is also replicated on the Ziz gun as well. Get the Ziz gun out. Gun. So yeah. So the Ziz gun has got a couple of abilities. Let's just talk about them quickly. It's got the light artillery barrage, which is exactly, pretty much exactly the same as the uh, artillery barrage that issue 76 does. So it's just, you know, again, you spend munitions, you can lob a barrage in. Very good against infantry, this barrage. And even if this barrage um, was to hit a vehicle, it would probably damage it as well. Okay. Once it gets to veteran C1, It has the ability to do tracking, so we'll pop that on. Yes. It got, gains a slight bit more vision, and it can see enemy units uh, through the fog of war. So if I was to make some grenadiers hiding around the corner here, what do you need? section owner enemy, we can see on our mini-map that now we've activated that ability, we can see there's a red dot on our mini-map. And if we press our tactical map, we can see that it was a grenadier. The ability just ended then. If I popped it back on, we'll you can now see that there's a grenadier hiding behind that bush. Um, but normally, if you look at the minimap, you wouldn't be able to tell what unit was until you clicked on the tactical map. So that's what, why the tactical map would be quite useful. Okay. And again, you can also have on hold fire and uh, prioritize vehicles. The reason why you want to might hold fire is because, for instance, you you're, um, you might want to set up an ambush. Because sometimes you can camouflage these uh, these Ziz guns if you've chosen a specific commander for them. So this commander here, Mechanized Support Tactics, allows these anti-tank guns to go invisible uh, with camouflage uh, wherever they are. I think that they become mobile when they're, when they're like that. But it's, you know, it's a nice way to maybe set up an ambush. You let your opponent come closer and then you can smash them as they're within the, you know, like in the, you want to try and get, get your enemy smashed while they're in like the middle of your arc, firing arc, rather than, at the, you know, rather than fire them at the edge. Because obviously if they're, if they're slap bang middle of your firing arc, 
then you'll, at least, you'll definitely always get two shots in. Because if you fire on your max range, you'll hit the enemy vehicle, and then he'll, they'll reverse back, and then you won't be able to get a second shot in. So that's why the, like, the whole fire and camouflage might be good. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll select that ability in a, in a while and talk a bit more about that later on. And then you've got the, uh, this half-track. So this half-track, you know, like the M3... And crew infantry. Like so. Only one unit can get inside an M3 over here. But I believe two units can get inside a the, the, the bigger half track, okay? But generally you only want you only ever want one squad inside this half track because as you can see, it doesn't matter how many men you put on it, only four will appear out the back. Okay? But it might be a good, it's a good way to, to get, get units around the map with, with this half track. But let's just jump these guys in and give you some more demonstrations of what this thing does. So if you've been paying attention, you can see that this half track has the ability to upgrade. Thank you, Nata Gellan, for the follow. Also, units inside, um, like the M3s and the, these half tracks, the M5 half tracks, can also cap territory points, like so. Now. We're capturing this point, so I have because you need to capture the point to be able to upgrade this ability. If we upgrade this ability, um, we gain a quad mount, which is very good against infantry, and it will shoot down enemy aircraft. However, it'll lose the ability to reinforce, as I will now indicate. Then we'll take this infantry squad and we'll kill a man. No, we won't kill the whole squad, which we just did. There, we'll we'll kill a man off the squad. And now you can see that our reinforcement button is active because we're near this half track. Okay, so I can reinforce this squad back to full strength with this half track, which is very nice. So this allows you to, to stay on the field rather than retreat your squads all the way back to base. Now, if I upgrade the half, the quad mount like so, I can no longer reinforce, as I'll show you. Selection. The I can no longer reinforce the squad because the quad mount's upgraded. However, the quad mount does, with, with night munitions, become very effective against infantry, as I'll show you. It also suppresses infantry, like so, like a machine gun does, and it renders the enemy infantry um, basically useless. However, it's very vulnerable to, like, pack guns or enemy armor, um, as it will be useless against them. Okay. And also, if an enemy plane was above, you know, above us, we want to use this cop mount to shoot the enemy planes down so they couldn't do any damage to it to our um to our, to our units okay so that was all the units in tier three so we're just going through the standard units here so we've gone through all the things there uh actually what's the sniper we just talk about one more thing about the sniper so the sniper has ability here has the ability to drop a flare in the sky when it gets veteran c1 so again we go uh, combat veteran c1 when it gets efficiency one, it has access to a flare. It's exactly the same kind of thing as the the mortar flare, but um, it costs a little bit more uh, by ten munitions more, and it's, it's, it's literally literally the same same thing. They could go like this: lob the lob the the flare in the sky, and then you'll be able to see vision over here on the map. Now, as an opponent, you'll be able to see that a flare's in the sky and realize your opponent, you know, that you uh, sorry. As the opponent, if you see a flare in the sky, you know your opponent has spotted your position, so that would mean you'd want to re reposition, okay? So anyone, any players can see that this flare is in the sky, okay? But the opponent is obviously not going to gain vision for that because it's an enemy flare, okay? Um, also, one more thing about the penals. So the penals have two different types of si a, a sticky, a sticky char uh, satchel charges. Both cost the same amount of munitions. Um, but this one is, is one that you just lob on the ground, like so. This is very effective against infantry, or, or or like maybe a bunker. You can use that to one-shot an enemy bunker if they build that on the map. But the sticky one um, follows the enemy vehicle around. The reason why you know you might want to lob the this you know you can't lob against this against infantry, but you can lob this one against infantry. And this would be a good way. I use this statue charge quite a few times to maybe try and kill retreating infantry if I time it correctly, because enemy you know you can. You normally tell enemies retreat path because they will always funnel back to their main HQ, right? So if I was, um, let's say this was a German base, an enemy was coming run, run, running back this way. If I lobbed the Satchel Charge here, the enemy, by well, the time they get to the Satchel Charge and it's, and it's detonated, they would have walked on top of it and then they would blow up, okay? So that's why you would want to use that. Also, Penals have a default um, veterancy ability called to call to the last man. I'll just vet them up for you. Combat veterancy 1. So th this, this ability is just a standard... Um, you know, uh, passive ability that, you know, that as they lose models, they'll fight harder and get better. 
Um, but generally, you know, you want to always make sure the squads are full health because obviously, you know, the, the lower health they get, the more chance they're going to get wiped and you don't want to lose the squad, okay? And again, for conscripts, conscripts abilities. They're the only squad in the game that has the ability to merge. Now, what the hell is merging? As you can see this big D button here. Merge. So let's say you had a... Um, come over here a second. Election, Bob members, seats. Now, conscripts have the ability to merge. So let's say you saw you had a weak anti tank on the front line. You want to make sure it's full. You know, it, you know, it's um, back to full strength. You can press D and you can merge. So two men of that conscript squad will merge onto that Ziz gun, basically. And then I can still re reinforce these guys back to full health. Do the same thing over here. I can merge with a penal squad. Like so. And then you can see three of those penals, that, that penal squad are now conscripts. Okay? Now, the, the, um, the conscripts will actually pick up the SVTs, but they will still keep the same armor values of the squad. So again, merge over here with the uh, so armor values of the original you know, squad being a conscript. So if I was to have a shock trooper squad, for instance... Infantry or a guard squad. So shock troopers models in general have a good armor value, which means they're take, you know they're, they're more resistant to damage. But if I was to merge this entire squad, um, squad members delete. Right, if I was to merge this entire squad into the shock squad. Yes, these conscripts would now have PPSHs, but they would also be very easy to, to take down. Uh, and they would be very vulnerable. Now, you'd want to merge because it's cheaper to reinforce a conscript squad than it might be cheaper to reinforce other squads. So, like a penal squad, for instance. Again, if I just quickly show you guys the um, the difference between... Um... What is it? So, you can see a standard... Um, uh, Choc Trooper squad man would cost 30 man amp power to reinforce. Ready. And a penal squad would cost 27, whereas a conscript is 20. Right? So, reinforce there. 20 manpower. Okay. So it might be a bit, a bit cost effective to, you know, save some manpower by, by through merging and also, like I say, to try and keep squads on the field if you need to, you know, if you want to make sure, you, you, you know, that maximum one man, you want to make sure he's got six, you know, he's, he's fully healthy. You can then merge and then, force, and then retreat back to base and heal up your conscript, okay? So merging is a nice little feature, especially with, like, combat engineers. Like, because combat engineers and conscripts kind of basically have, I, I don't know the... the exact statistics in terms of their armor values but they're very similar and if i was to delete a couple of models of this um this squad here right because a conscript squad sorry a combat engineer squad is only a four-man squad and they have the, 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 the valuable weapon which is a flamethrower so you might want to keep making sure you merge with this squad before, and don't let it retreat because the flamethrower you know you want to keep it on the on the field because it's the, the thing doing damage okay and it would cost you 21 manpower to reinforce a combat engineer, whereas it's, again, 20 manpower to reinforce a conscript. So you still want to, like, I'd always recommend merging with your mer merging with your, uh, your combat engineer um, rather than reinforcing it if you have a conscript squad back at base ready to, ready to merge with, okay? So always try and make sure that you, um, you know, if, if you can, keep your, your, your engineers on the field through merging with your conscripts, okay? So that's quite a nice little... Um, uh, you know, way to you know to keep your engineers on the field, you know, and even, you know, and that whole squad now will still 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 be able to repair this vehicle, even if it looks like conscript models. Let me just damage this a bit. Um, yeah. So if this is damaged, even the conscript models can can repair the the vehicle as you'll now see. Look. Like so. Okay. So also combat engineers, we talk about mines, but combat engineers can also be upgraded with sweepers. Thank you for the follows by the way guys. Thank you for tuning on in, hope you're enjoying this uh, boot camp session. So I always generally recommend whatever faction you're playing, always to have, apart from maybe OKW, because the stern pilings are very expensive, because that's the, the repairing unit and their mine sweeping unit, is always to have at least two engineer squads. So two rear echelons potentially, um, two combat engineers, two pioneers, why? Because you want one with a flamethrower and one with a sweeper upgrade. You'd always want a sweeper upgrade because you want to, you know, because like I say, mines win games, right? And you always want to be pushing forward with a sweeper to, um, 
to uh, to clear mines and to allow, you know, if you're going to drive a vehicle through here and push an enemy point, you don't want to hit a mine and then that push would be, be in vain. So now we're, we're, we're sweeping this minefield here with this, with this squad. The squad will automatically sweep the minefield. However, if, if there's an engagement happening, the squad won't sweep the minefield. Um, so to make sure to get the squad to sweep the mine, you have to right click the mine itself until it flashes. Like, right? See, when I click it, it flashes. Then I, then I definitely know that the squad is sweeping that mine. However, if, if while you're trying to sweep the mine, if a tank's shooting at you, that mine still could potentially blow up. Okay? Also, it's worth noting, a revealed mine... Will not trigger. So if I walked over this mine here, so this mine is an enemy mine right now. If I walked over it, I'm not going to blow myself up. Even if I got a vehicle over, let's bring a vehicle over here quickly just to show you guys. So even if I got a vehicle and drove over this mine, it won't blow up because we've revealed it. Okay. And it's also worth noting that if I put again put a mine down here, maybe maybe even some of you veteran players didn't know this. If I do selection owner enemy on this mine, any engineer squad nearby will also try and sweep that mine. So that this squad's the sweeper, but this engineer will sweep the mine because this guy's revealed it. Okay, so even that squad will go went went and swept the mine. So any engineer squad can sweep that that, that mine if nearby. Okay. Uh, another thing um, that uh, engineers can do is plant demolition charges. There you go, Dexter. Something you, you didn't know. You need something demolished. The demolition charges cost 75, 65 munitions, and any unit that comes in comes gets close to that, you can manually detonate that, blow it up. And kill any unit. I recommend, you know, demolition charges used to be invisible uh, unless you had a sweeper. But now, uh, any unit that gets near it, near to the mine will be able to reveal that mine, uh, reveal that demolition charge. So now, I recommend building demo charges on the corners of houses and stuff where your opponent might not potentially see it. So, like, for instance, a house here, your opponent might come on this door, get inside the door, then see the mine, but we, see the demolition charge. But it might be too late. Then you hit you hit the button and, and blow up the squad. So, demolition charges are very good. On houses, on retreat point paths where your opponent might be might not might not predict them. So demolition charges are very um, very effective uh, against wiping squads, and also they, they do quite quite a lot of damage to vehicles as well. Uh, okay, so let's now move on to our last piece of tech. So to call on to get the tier four, you need to build tier three. So you have to go. So you can either go tier one into tier three or tier two into tier three. Once you build tier three, then that unlocks tier four, which is this building here. So that is the mechanized armor company. Structure complete. Just delete all these squads for a second. Right. And then we'll bring on the Katusha, the, the, T, the, uh, the P T-34 and the SU-85. Okay, let's just show these lads off. Okay, so. Let me just quickly bring in. Right. Okay, so basically, the T 34 is the bigger brother of the T 70, the SU 85 is the bigger brother of the SU 76. They both fulfill the same roles. These are primarily anti infantry tank destroyers okay now this t-34 can also damage medium vehicles as well but it's not nearly be is going to be effective as an su-85 su-85 also has a lot better range than the t-34 okay um it's also worth noting that the t-70 and the t-34 once they gain veteran c1 like so they can capture territory as i will now indicate section combat veteran c1 However, I have to have secure mode activated. So if I was to come over here and try and capture this point, without it activated, it won't work. So I have to press this button. However, when I activate this ability, my uh, I can no, I I can't shoot with my main gun, right? So it becomes vulnerable. But it's still quite a good way, you know, if you're at the back line and you wanted to just capture capture a territory point, and there's no combat going on, um, then you could just use this ability to quickly capture a point, for instance, with the tank. T70 has exactly the same ability. 
Uh, but, you know, instead of pressing that button, you press this button to recon mode. Um, just delete this squad here. Right, so the recon mode activates its secure mode once it's got veteran C1. Recon mode makes it its gun um, inoperable, it can't fire. However, it does see a lot further. So this is it off. It on. Do that extra vision we gain. And then I'm going to give it some more veteran C. Selection, combat, veteran C. So we're going to give it maybe two more strokes of veteran C. Oops, sorry. And you'll see, be able to see even further. So there's the T70. That's its maximum range. Uh, one more veteran C stripe. Add a third one. And look at that extra amount of vision we gain when it gains veteran C3. So that's why I'm talking about why it's so important for um, you to always try and keep your squads alive, keep your tanks alive. Because when they veteran, get, gain veteran C, they become a lot more useful into the later stages of the game. You know, having this now, having this ability on is is great because this is a really good unison with the SU-85, okay? Because it's providing LOS for my SU-85. My SU-85 can then shoot enemy vehicles that you now see, um, with, um, while being full, uh, having a full maneuverability. So if I turn that off, we wouldn't be able to see that much. And the SU, because the SU-85's firing range is a lot further than it can actually see, okay? So having this ability on allows it to shoot its maximum potential range, okay? It's also worth noting that the SU-85 can sacrifice um, its uh, maneuverability um, to have to give itself more vision, like so. However, it can only see in front of it itself. It only gains that frontal, extra frontal little bit of vision, right? Whereas the T-70, with that ability on, gets to see 360 degrees around itself, okay? Unless there's something blocking, you know, line of sight blocking, okay? So I generally would recommend having, you know, the T-70's vision on, and the SU-85 without that on, so that you can gain the better, you know, the, that's a, you know, it's a very good combo, so because the T, you know, it allows this vehicle to be as maneuverable and fast as possible, moving around. So you can see this is its speed, like the moment. I'm just going to just, just show you the difference here. So you can see how fast it is at the moment. I pop on the vision, and you can see it gets considerably slower. I think it's 33% slower, okay, when it has this ability on, okay. So this would mean it'd be a lot slower to try and chase down enemy armor if it's trying to get away from it, okay? So that's the that's the SU-85. Um, um, oh, but it also has tracking as well. So the same kind of thing as, as um, what the Ziz gun had earlier. You can pop on tracking. Let's just give it Veteran C1 to just show you what it does. So again, tracking. Let's just put an enemy vehicle over here. Uh, bum, austere, infantry, or infantry, whatever. Pioneers here. Selection, owner, enemy. I'm tracking on, and then we can see that there's a grenadier that's still alive over here, and the pioneer here. We press the tactical map over here, and you can see what units that we've spotted on the mini map are. Um, there you go. So that's, that's the tracking ability for you there. Okay. So that's a good combination of units there. Let's go on the T-34 now. So again, like, always, like we spoke about, the T-34 has the ability to cap, but also. Um, again, like most vehicles, has the ability to hold, fire, and prioritize vehicles because you might want to shoot a vehicle rather than an infantry squad. So, you know, you want to get the last shot in. It also is the only vehicle in the game, the T-34 and the T-34-85 variant. The 85 variant is something you can get through a commander section, which we'll go into, onto, into a little bit later on, which can ram. Now, what is a ram? I'll show you. Let's get an OKW tank. Panther. Make it neutral. Owner. Neutral. Okay. So what does a ram do? Now a ram is kind of a last ditch thing that you want to do with your tank because once you do a ram, your vehicle becomes um, immobile. It loses its main gun as you're now witness. So let's see if we find this pan panther. Well, oh, it's not gonna let me ram. I need to make an enemy tank. Hang on, wait. So we're gonna ram the tank. So you can see what happens here. So my main gun's gone, and I'm now in mobile. But what we do do is we stun the enemy, the the um, the enemy vehicle for a short amount of time, and we give the enemy vehicle a damage engine. Okay. So this is a very good way to take down heavy axis vehicles. Because look, look now the enemy uh, enemy vehicle is um, is damaged. My SU-85 could just pick away at this uh, this Panther from range, and because it's like I said, it's got a damage engine, it's going to take a, a while to try and limp away. 
but it's kind of a last ditch thing you want to do because with a full health tank you make it useless right so if you're gonna basically you want to do the ram on a t-34 if it's basically you know you're gonna lose it anyway so that's why you want to ram or if you feel like you can you know you know it's worth the trade for instance so you want to use a ram against maybe a panther because you know panthers are a lot more expensive than a um than a t-34 because a t-34 costs 300 manpower and 90 fuel and a panther Apologies if I'm incorrect here, but I, you know, I know it's at least like something like it's 490 manpower and like um, 175 fuel. Oh, could that be Panther? I can't remember off the top of my head. But actually, I'm, I'm gonna be able to check here. 185. Yeah, we can tell here. Look, see, there you go. 185. There you go. So you can see there's you still. It's basically double the cost of fuel. You know, uh, a T34 Panther is okay. Uh, and it's also uh, quite considerably 190 manpower more as well. So, you know, if you manage to trade a T-34 for a Panther, you're winning, okay? That's a good trade. And the same thing as well. If you wanted to ram a King Tiger, an Elephant, um, a normal, just a normal Tiger, a Yag Tiger, if you, you know, you can ram anything and you'll always achieve the same result, which is a stun on the enemy vehicle and a damage engine. Um, it's definitely worth doing. Uh, if, however, if you can make sure you can get the wipe on the enemy vehicle, however, otherwise you've just thrown away a tank and not gain anything out of it. So you want to use the ram, um, you know, as kind of maybe a last ditch effort if you're going to lose the tank anyway. If you if you're pretty sure that you can use the ram in in, in, a, in to kill the enemy vehicle, um, yeah. So there you go. You won't get a damage engine. On a uh, yeah, so I think yeah, that might be correct. Actually, sometimes some vehicles you might just only get the stun. So like a heavier vehicle here, yeah, possibly, but still the stun might be enough because if you manage to stun the enemy vehicle, and then you chose this commander for instance, and you had anti-tank Overwatch, I could then drop in my my, uh, my abilities on top of my opponent. So let's just cho choose this commander for a second, All right? And then we pop this ability. So imagine we we rammed, and as soon as we ram the guy, we drop this artillery down on him. That enemy vehicle is stunned for like three or four seconds. It's got a damaged engine, so you know, first of all, it's not gonna be able to move for for a while. Then it's gonna try and limp away, and in that time, this artillery it takes a while to come down. But you know, the artillery is very effective against armored vehicles, as you can see here. Just, just smashes them hard, and you know, and you'll be also firing in with you know anti-tank guns and ziz guns as well, trying to hit hit that that vehicle as well. So it's a very good way, to, you know, to, if you want to try and take down maybe a tiger or a big tank by ramming it and then using this artillery strike on top of them. Okay. I don't know why that's a weird little bug there and it's floating stuff. But yeah, you go. It's, you know, it's just an idea of doing that kind of thing. Okay. I don't know why it's still firing. Good. Okay. All right. And then we use munitions, 200 munitions to activate that. No, so the last um, core unit in the arsenal for Soviets is the Katusha. This is a mobile artillery truck. Um, you don't have to spend any munitions to use this ability, which is great, apart from you know, if you want to use Creeping Barrage. But this, this ability of the Katusha is to drop artillery, and it's generally only effective against infantry um, and support weapons. But you can also do damage against light vehicles as well. You can, you know, if you're up trying to kill an enemy, an enemy Katusha, enemy, sorry, Stuka or Panzerwerfer, and these, ro these Katusha rockets hit that, it would, it would destroy that vehicle as well. But if you were firing this, these rockets on tanks, it wouldn't do much damage. As I'll um, quickly demonstrate. So let's just get some infantry. Let's just go Oster infantry. Let's make some Grens. Make um, Anzawerfer uh, 222. Okay. And then we'll come over here and make maybe some tanks just to indicate. Alright. Right, here we go. So we're going to fire on here. You see these rockets are very effective against this unit, these units here. There you go. So anything that's caught in that, that in, 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 you know, in that radius pretty much dies. But however, if we're going to try and damp, you know, fire the rockets on tanks over here, the two tanks. You'll see these rockets not do much damage at all. See, a, a rocket with a direct impact on the top of that Tiger tank. It's about 10% damage. I mean, if, if you were, 
I wouldn't advise sitting in the artillery, just as a general rule of thumb, by the way. Because obviously you will take a little bit of damage, um, so you obviously want to reverse out of it. But just, 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 just as a general principle, tanks... You know, like medium tanks and above will not take much damage from rocket from from Katusha fire. Now, another thing I want to talk about Katusha fire is that it's uh, it's spread. So we talked yesterday a little about it as well. So you can see here the spread is very tight. The further away I go, the longer the distance the spread. You know, the bigger the spread is. So generally, you want to get your Katusha fairly close to your opponent and then fire the artillery. However, you want to make sure your Katusha's always got units in front of it before you fire. You want to make sure it's protected. You never want to roll up, you know, come over here with the Katusha and fire on enemies over here without having anything in front of it. Because it's such a glass cannon. It will die to one shot from any vehicle. Any, any tank will just instantly one shot it. I'll just quickly show you guys that. If I come over here, this Tiger, you know, if I went, you know, was, was careless with this and the Tiger saw me, like so, instant death. One shot and it's completely destroyed, okay? So it's not, you know, not worth it bringing those units up that close. You always want to make sure it's safe, bring your units up first, you know, use the T-70 spotting vision to, to spot for any threats as well, which is a good thing, and then you can get the Katusha firing in, or use the, the spotting vision of the T-70 to then give yourself some targets to fire at with the Katusha. Right, so that was all of the, um, oh, one, yeah, we're going to talk about the Creeper Barrage again, actually, so also one more ability that the um, Katusha has is the Creeping Barrage, Selection, Combat, Metro C1. So the creeping barrage is exactly what it sounds. It basically the rockets will follow a certain path. So they, they, they'll fire here and then creep along this way, um, you know, like so. So it may be a good, you know, if you know your opponent's got like a big long front line, and that's a good way to, to fire your rockets. Or if you know, you know, if you want to fire this on the retreat path of your opponent. So you know, we know our opponents when it, when it, when his army retreats, they're probably going to retreat that way, right? So I probably want my these these creeping barrage rockets to be like that because he'll he'll take damage from the first set of rockets. And then I'll try and retreat back, and then the, the, the recruiting barrage will hopefully get his retreating units as well, okay? So, right, that is all the base units that we just talked about there, every base unit. Let's now go on to, um, let's come over here, and I'll build, I'll call on all the other unique units. So, these are all these commanded units. So, we've got guards, guards assault, guards airborne, shock troopers, partisans... Oh, some tank hunters and the commissar. Walk, walk, walk. This is just infantry. We'll just go through the infantry first of all. Right. There's lots of other infantry you can call onto the battlefield if you choose a specific commander. So guards, when they come onto the field, they're, they're in a, so these guys are, you know, generally a lot of these guys are elite infantry, so they're going to cost a lot to call onto the field. So shock troopers are, are quite expensive and so are guards, like generally 300 manpower uh, plus. So a guard squad has PTRS rifles like the penal squad with the upgrade, but it also can upgrade DPs, which allow them to be a lot more effective against infantry. So a guard squad, you, you know, is, is generally a unit you want to be firing at like medium range with. Um, they can lob a normal grenade, like so. You also have the ability to, to button stun an enemy vehicle. So that stops the enemy movement speed and rate of fire. So it's a good way to, to you know, use this in conjunction with maybe an anti-tank gun or your tanks. You pop this ability onto an enemy tank, and then you um, engage it, you know, with, with everything else you have. You've also got an ability called um, Firing Positions, where you need to unlock Hit the Dirt Veteran. Um, once we get, uh, if this, hang on a minute, one minute. The one that's against Veteran C, gains the ability to do uh, Firing Positions, so the guards can hit the dirt. Uh, reduces weapon cooldown, but stops movement. Cannot use ability when suppressed or pinned. That so allows them to... You know, fire faster basically, but you know, they can turn on the spot and shoot behind themselves basically. Whoa, whoa. However, they are, you know, an enemy vehicle will just run over them and crush them, right? They will not move out of the way because they're, they're, they're forced to stay in this position. So you've got to watch out for that, okay? Right, then you've got um, another type of guard squad, which is the commando guards, or rather the guards airborne. Basically, they can upgrade with DPs. So they get three DPs. So this unit is just only good against infantry now. Right. Actually, one second. Two seconds. Uh, let's just make another one of these. No, wrong one. We are guards on the move. So, so yeah, this unit here is it, the guards airborne are only good against infantry in general. So you upgrade the DPS it means they're good at range. If you want to upgrade the uh, PPSHs, they're going to only be good at close quarters combat. They all gain. They all gain PPSHs. Very good at close quarters combat. Um, 
you know, so, and I think, I don't know how many guard squads you can call in. I haven't really played this command too much recently, but you can call these guys in and, uh, like I say, they're expensive. This squad, now, with that upgrade, they gain a smoke grenade. Whereas this guy only keeps its uh, normal frag grenade. The smoke grenade is quite good for this squad because it allows them to get closer and do damage. They can do fire superiority. A hail of bullets will force enemy infantry to take cover. Reducing their accuracy and slowing their movement. So you can use that on an enemy unit as well to help you kill them. And um, they can call in a Stermovic stra Strafing one, which I actually didn't know. Unless this... this this may not be... I'm using a mod here, guys, and this is not the general the, uh, the general build. I just wanted to see, just to see if chat can confirm that is the case, because sometimes these, this mod might be slightly out of date to the main build. So I don't... I, I'm not entirely sure if that is still a thing. Can people in chat just confirm that? It is confirmed. There is something still in the game. Um, so once they gain veterancy, they can spend some 60 munitions to get a strafing run. So if you wanted to, to strafe down some enemy infantry, this would be only good against infantry. So planes would come onto the field. And come in and strafe. Strafe, strafe, that, strafe that area and do damage to infantry, okay? Then we go to shock troopers. We talked a little bit about shock troopers earlier. Basically, you know, pretty much the same as these guys now. Um, because they, both squads have got BBSHs, but probably the these guys have got a bit more... Um, Chance to get, you know, they've got more armor values than the than the than the, uh, than the, the airborne squad. It's the same thing. Lob a grenade and lob a smoke grenade to get closer. Okay, that's those guys out of the way. Let's talk about the commissar. Commissar is only winning one commander in the game. Commissar actually is, is quite a, a unique unit because it has the ability to um, to do distribute medical supplies. So any unit nearby that's taken damage, um, like so, health, annual hit points, minus 100 HP. We bring them closer to this squad. So the Commissar will heal them because they got a lovely lady medic on on there, which she, she heals up the troops. So it's like an aura, basically it's like an American ambulance kind of thing, or the British, British I, you know, closely re resemble this as to like the British squad with the infantry sections, which they can just pop their healing ability on. But this is you know, exactly the same kind of thing, and it heals, it heals the guys up, for no, and it doesn't cost you any resources to do that. They can love a normal a grenade, like so. They can activate some abilities, hold the line. Motivate nearby soldiers to hold the ground. Which, uh, increases target squad defenses, but greatly reduces movement speed. Um, then you've got select unit has increased action rate of fire, but easy to hit. So you, you know, basically just just some buffs, and you can do fear propaganda as well. So it forces enemy enemy unit to retreat. It's quite a useful unit, this the commissar, but you can only call on one of these at a time. Um, we have ground to there we go. go. Then you have the guards, rifle, infantry. So these basically, um, you know, a guard squad which actually come in with some Thompsons. Uh, and they're again good against close you know, close range with those Thompsons. They come on the back of a half track. Um, they can only love a grenade. They can lay they can lay a trip wire flare, which is an ability conscripts and engineers get as ability. Sorry, I forgot to talk about earlier. So um, they have to get both squads have to get vegetacy one. So basically, you lay a trip wire flare down like so over here. I'll just quickly just spawn in a Soviet engineer as well, a conscript. You can see here that they have the same ability with Veteran C1. Ten munitions it requires to, to do this. They build a tripwire flare here, which is, looks hard to spot on the map. But it's this little three little um, tripwire flare thing here, little metal rods in the ground. So what this does is an enemy enemy squad comes over it. They'll lose one model when they hit this, so they'll lose one man of the squad. And a flare will go up in the sky revealing the location. Okay. And then let's get on to the Partisans. So you have two different types of partisans. This is like generally for the partisan commander. You can call in an anti-tank partisan hunter squad. So they have they come in with a Panzer Shrek, a stolen Shrek from the Germans, and that is effective against all armored vehicles. And they also have the ability to snare, and they can lay mines down as well, which is quite nice. And then you have this other, you have an all partisan troop squad, um, which generally comes with um, they, can, they can camouflage. Oh, yeah, another thing about partisans, they, they have the ability to camouflage, which is very nice. So you can set up nice ambushes with these guys. So you wait for an enemy vehicle to pass. You, lob, you, you get the Shrek to fire in. Then you lob the uh, the AT grenade to get the crit if it's a medium vehicle, that kind of thing. Um, these guys can fly mines as well. They can lob monotops and they can also lob grenades. Also, because they're both camouflage units, they can hold fire. So you can set those ambushes up if you wanted to. Okay. Uh, other infantry units we'll talk about is the support units that we haven't gone through yet. So we've got the, the Dishka. 120 meter mortar, little anti tank gun, the. And. Right. 
These are more support units, and then we'll go over to what else we have there. We had the big howitzer boy and the B4. Right. That's artillery. These are support weapons. So basically, the Dishka is literally a, a better version of a Maxim. So, Maxim is this guy. Maxim can do sustained fire. It allows it to keep firing for longer, to keep the suppression longer. But the Dishka can activate other piercing rounds, which allows it to be effective against light vehicles, like half tracks and stuff, and not very effective against medium armor vehicles. But generally, the Dishka does more damage, um, and uh, it costs a bit more. And you can only call it. So, this is the commander we have at the moment. Um, so this this command we actually can call in all three of these units um, and this is the baby anti-tank gun So it's, it's like the Ziz gun, but does worse damage against vehicles, but it also has the ability to camouflage But when it's camouflaged We can move around actually so camouflage it can move around And it also can activate a hold fire since it's got camouflage and also it's got low canister round as well loading canister round reduces its range But the canister round becomes it makes it effective against infantry but you can see how the difference of its range, right? It's got very short range now. If I switch it back to armor piercing yeah. grounds, uh, its range will be um, greatly increased. Like so. See? A lot further further it can fire there, okay? Um, yeah. It's got passive vehicle tracking of HC1 as well. And then you've got the bigger brother of the standard mortar here. So you've got the standard mortar here. 82mm mortar. Then you've got the 120mm mortar. They're basically exactly the same thing. But this, the 20mm mortar does more damage. Uh, again, mortar, standard mortar barrage and the smoke barrage. You've also got the Vector C1 flare. So this thing doesn't need Vector C1 to get better flare. But this one does. They cost the same amount of munitions. Um, not sure why that is. But there you go. That's the difference there. And then you've got the two main on-map artillery pieces. The... ML20 and the B4. The B4 only fires one massive round, like so. This B4 is generally inaccurate where it fires. But anything, any infantry squad that's near that is dead. And also, like, it can even one-shot sometimes medium vehicles as well. But it only fires that one shot and it's got a long cooldown time. Then you've got the other one, it's the ML20, which fires uh, multiple barrage... Um, rounds. Good way to like, you know, take down an enemy artillery, you know, position or whatever, support weapons, and it just fires a few, okay? This bit, the B4 also has the ability to direct aim fire on a tank for 90 munitions, so if an enemy vehicle, um, you know, you, you see an enemy vehicle, you can pop that on there and it smashes a tank as well. But generally, guys, I mean, you can cancel the, the, them firing as well if you wanted to as well. But these units cannot be moved. Once you build them, they are, you know, they, they stay there and they become vulnerable. I generally don't like building these units. Um, these, these static artillery pieces because enemies can just use off-map artillery. Like can use your, they can just do a recon flight over, overhead and then drop, drop artillery on you with an off-map Stuka bomb straight away. And you just lost the unit. So generally, it's not really, really recommended to build these vehicles, these support artillery pieces... Um, until you know what kind of commander your opponent has selected. So let's say you know your opponent has picked a commander that you know that doesn't have any off-map artillery potential, then you might be able to get away and build one of these because your opponent, the only, only, other, only other way he's going to kill it is if he rushes in and tries to take it out with an armored vehicle of his own. Um, so, or he tries to counter RT it with uh, on-map outs of his, of his own. So g generally, like these things are not generally a good idea to build. Uh, as I've just stated, but um, yes, comrade. you know, against you know, for newer players, you probably could get away with maybe making one of these and, and, and just seeing how it goes. They do, do they have got the good thing about them is they have massive range, as you can see on, on, on this on a 1v1 map like this, they can literally hit the entire map because it's such a small map. But on, on bigger maps, that, they, that you know, they you know, they would, they would still be able to you know, build you could build them outside your base and still be able to hit the front line pretty much quite easily. Um, but yeah. Okay, so that was all the uh, support new, the support weapons from commanders that you can call in. Let's now go on to um, the unique tanks. So we have the 85. So basically, the 85 costs a little bit more than the, the 76. Uh, it's just basically a beefier version, you know. It, does, it has exactly the same abilities, but it's just beefier. You know, it can take a little bit more damage, just a bit more damage out, uh, and still do decent damage against infantry, right? So if you can afford a bit more resources, you might want to make the T-3485. But if you feel like you just want to use a couple of cheap T-34s to maybe get some cheap, you know, because you know, you'd rather want to ram with a 76 than an 85 because obviously the 85 costs more, it's more valuable than the 76, right? So you can you can choose between the two there. Um, so when you, when, you ha when you pick a commander that has the 85, you can choose either or that you want to build. 
Um, but generally, you can only build that. But yeah, there you go. That's the the difference. You know, the two the two tanks there. Okay. Then we'll show you the other big. So we're talking the big boy tanks now. The IS two, the ISU. Um. Just in that way. The KB one, the KB two, the KB eight. And the M4C Sherman. Okay, all of these the tanks are... You can only call these onto the field if you've chosen a specific commander. This is an ISU tank. This tank has very good range. It can fire quite far, as you can see. Whereas the IS-2 can't fire nearly as far. The ISU can switch between high explosive rounds and armor piercing rounds. So that allows it to be effective both against armored vehicles and infantry. It can also do a um, concrete piercing round, which is very good at smashing through op battlefield obstacles or maybe, you know, sm maybe smashing a an enemy vehicle from afar as well. Um, and again, you can hold fire, prioritize vehicles and have tracking, okay? This unit has a fixed turret. So it'll have to turn to shoot things. Now the IS-2 has 360 degree turret traversal, okay? And, um, you know, this unit is also good against infantry and tanks, but it's, it's uh, again, the thing about these big tanks, these big heavy tanks, all, all of these, is they're quite slow compared to, like, the T-34s and the, and the T-70s, okay? So they're, they're quite slow. You want this unit, the ISU, at the back of your army, sniping away. Treat this as a sniper tank. You're firing away at range, because as soon as it gets in the front line, it becomes a lot easier to get flanked, okay? You can also upgrade it with a, di a dish, dish can mount on top. One second, let's just... Uh, selection owner me. Thank you for the follows, guys, as well. Cheers, guys. Endless greed. Cheers, mate. So I can upgrade the Dishka machine gun mount on top, and then you get even more damage against infantry. So you upgrade that for 60 missions, and then that gun will be effective against infantry as well. Same thing with the IS-2. You can upgrade the IS-2 with, with the same gun on top. Okay. And this thing also has a fragmentation shell. The shell is devastating to soft targets, so that you know you can. Spend 45 munitions to smash an enemy infantry squad, that kind of thing. Um, and generally, you know, this thing, this thing can go toe to toe with a tiger tank. Uh, but against like thing like an elephant or a yak tiger, again, any any ally vehicle, sorry, any ally vehicle in the entire game, you don't want to have them in a one on one fight. You know, do you know trading blows, front llama to front llama against an elephant or a yak tiger. You know, because they're they're better up. You know, the axis armor. So what I'm talking about there is these units. So, um, so the Yag Tiger, which is from the OKW version, and then the Ostia version, which is the, um, the elephant, okay? So you don't want, like, you know, you don't want these units, you don't want to be firing a max range against these units, right? You want to try and flank, you want to try, against these units, you're trying to want to get, like, T-34s and flank around and shoot them, because both again, both these Axis tanks have, again, fixed turret as well, so they, so they have to turn to shoot, and they're also, again, very slow and immobile. They might be the best tank destroyers in the game, but, you know, they have very slow maneuverability and, uh, you know, and, and that fixed turret is, you know, makes it very vulnerable. So that's, the, uh, that, you know, that's something you should note there, okay? So watch out for these two, two bad boys. You don't you want to try and flank these guys, not fight them on a head-on fight. Even with a big tank, these big tanks like these, you won't have a good time, okay? You always want to try and flank them. Okay, so IS-2. Uh, generally a good, you know, good tank. You know, it's very tanky in the sense that it's got a lot of health and armor. You know, medium vehicles like Panzer IVs and, and Pumas will have difficulty trying to penetrate that. But Panthers and Tigers and above, those kind of things will be able to penetrate this thing from the front sometimes and definitely from the rear. Okay, KV-1. KV-1 can be built from Tier 4 once you have it selected on your commander choice. Basically, treat the KV-1 as a beefier version of a T-34. Um, it's got a lot of health, but it, you know, it... it sacrifices mobility for that it's quite slow so this is and this vehicle is good against medium vehicle uh and infantry it's not very good against panthers and uh, things above that like tigers and stuff it will have very difficult difficult time trying to fight them uh then you've got a kb2 now kb2 is kind of like a almost like an artillery tank um you know it has decent range uh, if you if you set it up in firing position so it's center range can fire about here if i set it up to um become immobile uh, it then can fire a lot further, takes a while to set up, and then I can fire, look, I, can, I can lob my round a lot further. So that was my minimum range, and now I can lob the round quite a lot further, like so. 
And again, you probably want your T70 there to provide LOS to give yourself vision on what you want to fight. Or maybe use, again, like your mortar to give LOS with your flares and that kind of thing there, okay? And, uh, you know, the artillery, this uh, KB-2 is very good against infantry, medium vehicles, and that's about it. I mean, it can penetrate like Panthers and stuff as well, but sometimes it won't because it generally its rounds are uh, high explosive rounds. So um, it won't generally, you know, penetrate things like Tigers and Panthers. Um, but if it, if it does penetrate, it will do some nice damage. Um, but generally, again, it's, it also, again, thing about this tank, it's very slow. And, um, you know, uh, it does have 360 degree turret traversal, so you can, you can uh, shoot behind it. Wait, what have I done wrong here? But yeah, I can just yeah. You see, it can can turn around and shoot all the way around behind myself and to do, do 360 degrees. But you can see how slow that turret is, right? Right. Moving on to the KV-8. So like the KV-1, very tanky, but basically about the same amount of speed. But this one thing um, is has a flamethrower on it. Very effective against infantry and support weapons. It will burn infantry really quickly and kill them very fast. Better than like a main gun or, or like maybe a normal tank can. Um, but it can also swap over its tank to a main gun 45 main gun. This main gun makes it okay against medium vehicles, but still a medium vehicle would probably do better against it. Um, you know, and this gun would be very crap against killing, trying to do damage against Panthers or anything um, like that, okay? But if you want, you know, the, if you were up against armor, then you'd want to switch over to, the, over to the main gun rather than the flamethrower, because the flames will not do any damage to the vehicles at all, okay? But so, okay. Also, with Veteran C1, it has the ability to inspire infantry. Infantry will move at maximum speed and fire more frequently as well, so it's good to use infantry around that tank once against Veteran C1. Uh, then we've got the M4C Sherman. An upgrade with a Browning machine gun. For 50 munitions. 60 munitions, sorry. Um, basically, it's like a bit like the other the American Shermans and stuff. It's, um, you know, tree, it's like a T-34 almost, basically. Medium vehicle. Um, you can swap between uh, height VAT rounds. Which is good against um, heavy armor targets, so better against vehicles. And then it can also load back on. Um, oh, my piercing rounds. Hang on a minute. Executing orders. Uh, one thing, uh, Quang, we'll talk about those infantry squads as well in a second. So, um, yeah, it can load hate back rounds, which is good against armor targets. Uh, so yeah, generally decent against armor, but um, you know, and, and okay against infantry. It also the Sherman also has the ability to lob, lob smoke rounds as well, like a smoke canister, which is quite nice. So you could use this to 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 um, cover your retreat or maybe cover your attack, which is quite nice. I like to use this ability a lot when I'm playing Americans. It's a very nice ability. You spend 30 minutes to get a nice good smoke screen on the front line, you know, and then you could like push all your armor forward, for instance, and get when that smoke screen's down, because obviously you know, enemy is not gonna be able to see through that. Okay, and I think that's all the units. Um, I think I think I might have missed a couple of things in terms of uh, someone in the chat was saying, Quang was saying about um, something that you can spawn in certain buildings. So like the Parsons and I believe the airborne squads can spawn into ambient buildings rather than being um, pulled on off the map. Uh, but I can't do it at the moment because I've just chosen the specific commander. I think what we'll do now is um, let me just double check to see what we haven't gone through right now. Uh, right, let's just see everything. All the infantry has gone through there. Uh, light vehicles. Other units. There's a campaign unit, so you're not going to learn about them. Right. I think what I'll do now is just go into the campaign menu. The M5 half track, we already went, we had basically the, um, we went through, the M5 half track is basically the same thing as the other one, right? Okay. I'm just going to go to the main menu now, guys, and just go through some commanders for you and, and talk about like some good commander choices that you could do for this faction. And then we'll play, we'll probably narrate and probably play a game of Soviets and tell you what I'm doing. Uh, we went through the clown car, the M3s and stuff at the start of the stream, if you guys missed that. Again, if any of you have just joined and you've missed um, a portion of the stream, I will be uploading this to my YouTube channel later on. Uh, probably on Monday. I'll probably try and get all those videos uploaded on Monday next week. Okay. Right. So, let's go over to... It. Right. So, you've got... If you've picked up 
Uh, so, Mitch, you probably don't have all these commanders like I do, but I'll go through some of the ones that I recommend that you guys should have on your loadout. So, one of the big, the best commanders I feel like for 2v2, um, 2v2 and above, would be the mechanized support tactics. Let's, that one, there we go. This commander here. So, here you have the guards. You can have marked vehicle target. You've got IS-2 assault gun, like we, we just spoke about. You've got your off-map ability with the R2 bombing strike. So this is, you know, a really good commander as it allows you to have good late game potential with the bombing strike and the ISU and good early game potential with the guards and with the with the um, camouflage on your anti-tank guns. The Mark Vehicle is an ability. Um, so there's lots of different abilities in Company Heroes 2 um, that you can use um, through through calling on, uh, through choosing a commander. Mark, Mark, Mark Vehicle is one of them. This is an ability that allows you to um, mark an enemy vehicle and your... Penetration damage is increased, so you can you can do a lot more damage to enemy vehicles. So if you wanted to pop, let's say we wanted to kill a king tiger, you pop this this this, this ability. So you click the ability, you pop it on the enemy tank, and then you can then focus, then that's when you attack and you try and get as much damage done to the enemy vehicle as possible. Okay, that's a very good commander. Mechanized support tactics is that one there. Okay, um, guards motor as well is another good one for team games as well, uh, or even one v ones because you get guards again. You have the better version of the T3485, which you can, you know, it says zero CPs. So that doesn't mean you can call it on straight away. It, that means you, you can now build it from tier four once you have a, a tier four available. You have access to the better mortar. You've got vehicle crew repair, repair training and again, marked vehicle as well. So crew repair training allows your vehicles to repair out of combat without needing engineers, but you have to pay munitions for it. So it's a nice little ability there. And then you've got the defensive tactics, which is one I've got at the moment, which is quite a nice 1v1 commander, as it allows you to um, call on lots of, Three nice little support units in the early game, which can really boost your um, um, your combat ability. Um, and, you know, for instance, you go penals with a little anti-tank gun, which is what I like to do when I'm playing 1v1, because the anti-tank gun can complement my penals with the PTRS rifles. And then late game, you've got uh, access to anti-tank overwatch, which is a very nice ability, as you saw earlier, which, which blows up enemy tanks that are in the vicinity. Um, some other good commanders you might want to choose uh, for, for, for team games. Is Soviet Industry Tactics. So Soviet Infantry Tactics, it gives you the KV-2 and KV-8 and then later on in the game. Uh, it also gives you access to the repair station. So your engineers can rebuild a, a structure called, known as the repair station. And that repair station um, has a couple of engineers on it which go around and repair um, friendly armor. So it doesn't have to be your own armor. They'll also repair uh, American and British armor of your teammates. So it's very nice. So this is a very good teammate. Um, you know, it's the only commander in the game for allies to, to, um, to do this. Apart from SimCity uh, for the Brits, which does, uh, which you can upgrade your forward assembly there to also have engineers on as well. But um, you know, for the Soviets, it's a very nice ability. You can also um, power drop in fuel um, into your base if you wanted to. So spend manpower to get fuel, or sorry, munitions to get fuel. I can't remember which one it is now. And again, vehicle crew repair training again as well. Um, you've got one. There's a commander that I see a lot of people playing in 1v1 as well. Where are you at? I'm trying to find him. Armor Assault Tactics I've seen quite a lot in 1v1 as well lately. So um, the first ability here is Radio Intercept. This is a really, really sick ability, guys, which allows you to immediately hear what your opponent is building right from the start of the game. So as long as you're keeping an ear out the entire game, you'll always be one step ahead of your opponent because you'll know exactly what your opponent has been building the entire game. So basically, when you, when, you, when you hear, like, say, a conscript has been built, you'll also hear through the radio chatter, oh, a grenadier has been built, a panther has been constructed, or something like that. So you'll know exactly what your opponent has got on, to, on the field. So it allows you to provide, allows you to prepare, basically, in time for when you actually see the unit on the field. So, you know, it gives you a little bit of a clue, right? So, for instance, if you heard, like, right at the start of the game, a sniper has been built, then you think, oh, I could get a counter, I'll get, I'll get my own sniper out and then hide it and then counter snipe because you wouldn't expect that straight away. Or I'd get an M3 to try and charge it down before he's got a chance, okay? Again, you also have access to the T-3485, vehicle crew plane, and then you've got plane ability, the R2 Stemovic, so the planes will come down and strafe enemy infantry and stuff, and also access the IS-2 heavy tank later on in the game as well. Um, yeah, so there's some of, the, some of the core, some of the commanders I would recommend. Some commanders I think are probably a bit garbage. Um, like tank hunter tactics is not too great. Soviet shock army is pretty meh. Soviet reserve army as well. Like... Um, shock rifle frontline tactics, maybe. Soviet combined arms. I mean, this is not too bad. The Soviet combined arms one. I mean, here you can do you can do recon overflight, 
in conjunction with an R2 bombing strike. Because you need vision to be able to call on the bombing strike, but you don't need vision to call on a, a recon plane, right? So you can recon and then drum bot straight away as well, which is quite nice. And then you have the gun, you can build the gun house as well. So that's not too too bad of a commander choice. Um, you've got the partisan tactics commander. It's kind of like a, a meme commander. Not many people play it. I mean, it can help you out. Uh, it doesn't really have good late game potential. It's got the Mark vehicle, which is nice late game, but that's pretty much it. Um, again, you get ready intercept as well, which is great early game. Um, it's kind of like um, a commander. Like, because partisan troops are really expensive to reinforce. And once you've, like, showed that you've gone partisans, your opponent's going to be wary, you know, and, and expecting them in the future, right? So, um, you know, and they're not really good into the late game partisans. They, uh, you know, they're, they're good in the early game for that surprise factor if you can get that light vehicle kill early. But later on, they're, they're not too good. Um, let's have a look here. So there's some, so there are a few of the commanders. I think I, I, these are all the commanders you can get for Soviets. So what is it? One, two, three, four, five, eight. So 16. Um, 24. Yeah, 24 commanders in total for the Soviets there. And uh, so tomorrow we'll go over, to, go over the Ostir, by the way, guys, if you, if you didn't know. Um, but yeah, these are all the commanders that we have. You, you can call on for, 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 the, for the Soviets. You can only pick three of these. In your loadout so you can't just pick you know have all of these at your disposal you have to choose three and what i would recommend guys is choose three of the of some nice diversity so here i've got for instance one commander i've got okay i've got um an isu a long range tank destroyer and, and, and long range anti-infantry um unit as well and some and some you know it's good all-round commander that one here this is like kind of like you know if i feel like i'm really lacking the early game i might want to get beef up my early game right i'll choose this commander if you know if i'm behind you know i, I might want to call on some of these these units um, then you've got the guard mortar as well, which is kind of like, you know, yeah, again, it depends. Like, do I, I'm, I might want to choose this commander if I fancy I need that mortar, but I also want the T-35s later, then I wouldn't want to choose this commander, right? Because I can get the mortar there, but I wouldn't get the 85s later. So it's just basically, you know, picking and choosing. Uh, generally what I do in a game, guys, is I choose my commander, um, either if I've got a specific build in mind that I want to I want to commit to, or to counter my opponent. So if I say see my opponent, for instance, um, going a certain way, um, let me think about it. So yeah, if I, if I feel like my opponent's playing very support heavy, or I feel like you know it's going to be a game that's going to go into the late game, then yeah, I want my ISU there so I can start wiping his veteran C5 squads with the ISU later on into the into the match. If I feel like this is going to be a quick game, then I might want you know to finish the game early. Let's get on you know get the early support weapons out that kind of thing you know. Or if I feel like, you know, I'm playing with my teammates and I feel like no one else is going to go for um, artillery, then I might want to choose this artillery commander, that kind of thing. You know, it's a good way to, like, you know, before you, if you're playing with friends, try and um, talk to each other beforehand saying, oh, I'm going to go for this commander. So if you're going for that, if you're going for a heavy tank commander, you're not really focusing on artillery. Maybe I should do that or vice versa, basically. So try and, like, figure out what you guys are doing and then try and complement each other, right? Because it might be a really good idea. You could have one player, um, you know, having a recon ability and then the other player having an ability to drop artillery off map, which is like the R2 Semivix. So you can have your American friend doing a recon overpass, giving you vision, and then you can drop your own artillery off map, your command ability onto that enemy uh, emplacement, for instance, okay? Okay, so let's um, go into a match ourselves then. So we're going to play a game of Soviets. Um, let's... I will uh, go through it. Unless we can quickly go and see if there's a game we can just cast. Let's have a quick look before if we... Let's see. see if anyone's playing Soviets. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll watch this game here. There's a guy here playing uh, Soviets called Artyom. And he's up against uh, another dude. Don't know who these guys are. But we'll watch this game. See what's what. Oh yeah, and uh, we should also talk about bulletins before we finish. But generally, guys, as, as, with any faction, you always want to be using bulletins for your units that you use, and it's generally the infantry, the core infantry of your army. So for for for, for Soviets, you, if, you, if you're going to play penals, have penal bulletins. If you're going to play conscripts, have conscript bulletins. If you're austere, grenadier bulletins. If you're OKW, Volks bulletins. Why that? Because you're going to use those units the entire hundred percent of the game, right? You're not going to have, you know, I, I don't, I highly um, do not recommend. Picking tank bulletins. If you put tank bulletins, uh, that's not a good idea because you're not using those tanks. You only use those tanks like the last half an hour of a match, right? If you if you might even get to that late so you might lose the game before you even get tanks. So you want to make sure you have um, those bulletins available. Um, you know, at the end, because you know, bulletins give your units a couple extra percentages on you know more DPS or receive fire that kind of thing as well. So you want you want to get the, you know have that advantage if you can uh, rather than not, right? 
but generally those small percentages won't change the outcome of a, of a fight generally, but it helps, you know, every little helps. But you can, Victor is also saying, you can use bulletins for extreme mind game. So, like, if, you know, generally, like, if you've not, you know, it's being a little bit silly, but you could pretend to have, like, conscript bulletins. So your opponent thinks, oh, he's going to go conscripts this game, and then play penals, and then you'd be like, whoa, dude, I'm not expecting that. But, you know, it's just, you can, you know, you can play a little bit of mind games with the bulletins uh, sometimes, you know, because people might expect that. But generally, you know, I wouldn't read too much into it. You know, I could, I have, you know, I could take my all my bulletins off and I still win ninety percent of my games basically because, uh, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's all about positioning, um, you know, strategy, micro, all those kind of things, rather than just the core values of certain units. Okay, let's watch this game here. So we're gonna watch this the Soviet player Artyom play. I don't know how good he is, but we'll see. Like, we'll just see what kind of build he's doing. He's playing up against the OKW player. He's gonna go. It looks like he's going for tier one. So he's also not building. You know. Sometimes people like going double engineer start to capture more of the map early. But we're going one engineer allows him to get a penal squad out faster so he can be a bit more aggressive. We're going to fast forward this a little bit as well. Pioneers it's also... Oh, did you hear that? Pioneers all ready for, for assignment. So he knows his OKW uh, uh, opponent has built a second stern pioneer, okay? So that, that, you know, that allows him to anticipate um, you know, what's going to happen in the game. Because he's chosen the commander... Um, armored assault tactics because he's got the passive radio intercept. Okay. He goes with the capture the point and move on. So here's another good um, little tip here: wiring off cover. So this stone pioneer has come over to this green cover site and made it and wiring it off so his opponent can't use it. Very nice little um, use of resource, you know, because he's. You're going to be capping that territory anyway, and your unit's going to be idle. You might as well use that time while the squad's not doing anything to um, give yourself an advantage if you can. And here he's giving himself the advantage of denying his opponent cover. See? And now he's capped the point, and he can, he can move on now. Right, so we see the first penal squad's going over there. You really know he's built a, built a Volk squad now. He's going for, it looks like this, the OKW player's going for double munitions early here, so... I wonder what he's going to do. But we now have the M3 out, so I would imagine he's going to get the... Um, he's driving over to his penal squad to get the uh, penal squad in there. He knows his opponent's got double stern pioneers, so he knows he can probably do a lot of damage to those stern pioneers um, if he rushes them with this M3. So he's just waiting yeah, he's just waiting for his M3 to come by, by and get, in, get his dudes in there. Building another, making sure he's always building new squads. See, he's not, neither side is floating manpower, so both are always making sure they're trying to get more squads on the, on the field. We have an early mine going down over here. A pot fog of war on. I don't think he sees it. Yeah, neither side sees each other. So a good play against the M3 build in the early game is to put down a mine. And bait your enemy into that mine. Because if an M3 hits the mine, it becomes very easy to destroy. It might even one-shot the, the, the M3 if it gets low enough. So here, he needs to try and use the M3 as, as much as possible at the moment. He can get nice up and close and personal against these Volks Grenadiers, because it's the start of the game, right? Volks Grenadiers do not have the access to, um, to, um, the Faust right away. He's now jumping out. M3's getting a little bit low, but he's able to push back those Stern Pioneers. I'm not sure I agree with him jumping out with the Penal Squad there, because the Penal Squad just took unnecessary damage there. He's going to try and push around with these Volks Squads, actually, to, to stop them firing, which is good play here, because you can push squads around. So they're, like, they're not actually firing. And there's also, he positioned the M3 there, so the, the back gun and the front gun fire at the same time there. So you can do double, double the amount of damage, right? But he did end up winning that engagement, and he forced back three of the his enemy, enemy squads. And now he's going for the, he's also going for his opponent's cutoff and denying the resources as well. So we do have that uh, we do have a stern pioneer coming in from the north here. Penal's getting a nice little, you know, he was on negative cover here, so he's going to take a lot of damage, but both squads here are on negative cover, so they're both going to receive a lot of damage here. And that third pioneer got bullied. Don't think he'll get picked up on retreat path here, but he's trying to make sure he gets as much damage as possible against his squad. And he's repair he's got sweepers here, which is a very good idea, because he knows his opponent has um, got double stern pioneer, so he, he, the likelihood for a mine being down early is quite high. So that's a very good play. Third penal out now. We do have a mid truck going down here, battle grouper headquarters, so we'll have, we'll have, he'll have, have access to uh, Faust soon. Make sure he captures the fuel point. 
<laughs> also, make sure you notice here that he was trying to engage the Stern Pioneer squad on this side, where it's only got one window. So that's a very good engagement for those penal squads to take that to take that fight. He's now spotted that mine. I don't think he's going to sweep it for some reason. At least he knows it's there now. He's going to quickly go around to the left-hand side and see if he can catch up, ca capture the the fuel point on the left. And now he's, re he's built himself a second engineer so he can build tier 3, I'd imagine. Or no, he's going to get himself a flamethrower on that squad so he can put it in the M3. But it's still a good idea from him to bring the sweeper over here because he knows the stone pioneers were capping over it earlier. So he's pushing forward with the sweeper first. You know, even if you're inside a vehicle with the M3, uh, but, so the sweeper's inside a vehicle, you can still sw spot mines from, from the M3. So what he's probably going to do is probably put the, uh, the flamethrower inside the M3 and chase down some Volk squads. Looks like both sides capping in their respective side of their map now. Yes. Healing up his squad here before pushing it back onto the field. I'd imagine he'll probably get healing next so he can heal up his troops. So that's probably the next uh, buy I would expect to see him do. Okay, okay, it looks like he's now going to try and go re uh, Assault the cutoff once more. And we do see a flat half in production for the OKW players. That's got to be, got to be careful here. So these Volks can now hand the Faust. But he's not had any munitions this game. Oh, he's just laid his second mine over there. So he's not going to be able to Faust his M3. So this M3 um, can actually cause a lot of damage. But he's being very careful with the M3 because he knows Faust might be available. But also, I just want to pause right here. He's put all his squads on the retreat path of this Volk squad here. So he's going to have the best chance possible to try and get the wipe so he's, he's positioned his whole army over here because he knows um that the squad's gonna have to retreat through him so we might see i'm very likely we're gonna see a wipe here he's gonna hit that mine and he did he did he did spot it earlier but it should be a dead, dead vault squad he does get the wipe there so that's the first wipe of the game there oh uh, this vault squad's in cover let's be careful here double sturms Double Sturm, I think he's going to push here. I think he's going to push here regardless. He could get Fausted. He's not going for the Faust. I don't, even, I, I think, the Faust wouldn't kill the M3. It would only be, bring it down to about 30% health. Because the Faust is about 50% damage to an M3. Oh, Double Sturm's focusing down that penal. So that was very careless there. He lost his penal there. He wasn't paying attention there. I think he was trying to micro this squad over here. And he's lost his, uh, he lost, you know, because Sturm's, you know, very good at close quarters combat. And he wasn't paying attention there. And he lost his, his, one of his full health teams very quickly. He's still not paying attention here. He's going to lose his, he loses his other squad here. Black half Trek's coming in to give assistance. Very lucky not to lose two squads there. And good, good use here of pushing these Sturm Pioneers to stop them pushing, uh, stop them doing damage. But he probably should retreat them as well. Here comes the Black half Trek. Black half Trek could easily destroy the M3. He needs to reverse away now. He's not reversing away. And the flat car is shooting the wrong unit there. Should have shot the M3. Now the M3 is going to get away. That's the flat car track's range. So let's see what he's going to do in the base. I'd imagine he, you know, okay, he's buying healing now, but he, he was floating 500 manpower. So he could have bought this healing a lot sooner. And because he's delayed his healing, he's going to take a bit longer to get back onto the field now. Um, but he can reinforce his whole army up straight away. With that, with that float, he's got of resources. But again, he's running quite slow. He could be reinforcing right now with these squads, but he's not doing so. I don't know what he's doing. He's deciding to go for a second M3. Now, this is a very interesting play. Against Battlegrouper headquarters with the flat half track. It might not be actually a bad play if he gets double penals in both M3s and rushes the flat half track. Now, with, with that, you know, because the M3 will die very quickly. Sorry, this um, flat half track will die very quickly to M3 fire. From from two uh, two penals in, in two M3s, because it is a, a light vehicle after all. Here we go. Here comes the second M3. But I imagine he's gonna. Oh, what's he gonna do here? Okay, he's gonna only put one in one of them in there and put the flame in the other one. So OKW player is uh, he's, uh, he's lost one of his units, one of his Volk squads here, but he's a little bit behind because he's not got much map control. Here we go. Here comes the double M3. So I think this was a bad play right now because he's just revealed the double M3 too early, I think, here, because he's just pushed against this um this one Stern Pioneer. So now 
the Okanobi player can reverse back to safety. He probably should have waited and brought the M one of the M3s around the back here to try and get at the retreat path of this flat gun. But now he's pushed down the front. It's giving him warning now to, to, to pull back if he needs to. So I think this is a little bit too um, be risky. I mean, he's, he's going to be aggressive here. He still might be able to get away with this. He might even be able to pick up the Stern Pioneer squad here. Oh, but he runs right into that really well-placed mine. And almost wipes the entire penal squad. But I still think this Stern Pioneer squad is going to get wiped. Yeah, it does go down. So an M3 for a, a Stern Pioneer is probably worth it. Meanwhile, he's going to love a satchel charge over here. Is the OKW player mate playing attention? He is. Doesn't lose any men there, just about. But again, the M3, another, the other M3 gets down and taken down by the flat car track. So he's not paying attention um, to this M, to the flat car track. And also, he should have probably pushed forward with, the, with his sweeper first, with the M3s, to spot for mines. But he lost both his M3s there quite carelessly, you know? Always push forward with the sweeper. I don't know where his sweeper was, but it was on the south side for some reason. The, again, good use of planting mines here, you know, to try and slow his opponent down. Use those munitions up if you have them. So both these flak... So as an OKW player, you, I'd imagine he will want to salvage both these wrecks, because he can get um, five fuel from each of these, so get ten fuel. So get, you know, because he's really struggling right now in terms of map control and, and resources, because he keeps getting his cutoff taken. So I'd imagine we might see some tech now from our, uh, from our Soviet player. He's got enough resources in the bank to build, start building tier three. So we'll, hopefully we'll see that in a second. Uh, I guess he's just going to reinforce first before doing that. We do see another truck being built and another Volk squad being built in the base. So he's going to try and see if he can tech up. But he has no fuel really to do anything with it. There you go. He's salvaging his resources. You can salvage with Volk's grenades as well. So if you're a Soviet player and you notice your M3 is um, blown up or something, you probably want to destroy the uh, the wreckage. Or you know any any wreckage that you find as an allied player in general. Destroy the wreckage because your OKW opponent could use that to their advantage. Okay, he's making more M3s. This is a really strange build. So I would be very against this because he's tried this once. It wasn't very successful. And um, he should be thinking of taking up now and using his map advantage, you know. Okay, let's just pause here for a second. <coughs> this flat half track is overextended without any support. And this, he needs to be very careful of this penal squad because this penal squad can lob that sticky satchel to blow him up. So, and it was also, he can just, he's taking damage anyway. So I think he's going to pull back here, set up, and try and suppress the squad. Uh-oh. Don't. What's he going to do? He's going to... No, he's going to lose this now. What's he doing with that? That's dead. That was very careless of that M3. You know, so that flat car track pushing out there. Unsupported. Always support your units if you can. He just pushed it forward there without anything helping it. And he was in, got, in, got in trouble. He wants to try and put his flat, flat truck down on this cutoff, but it's a little bit too soon. He probably should have made some more infantry before trying this, because he's just outnumbered, really. He's trying to, you know, and one of his one of his core fighting units is going north to cap the rest, so he's going to be still, he's going to be seriously under strength down on the south side. MG over here though should be able to help out and suppress these this, this, this penal these penal squads. There he goes, get some nice suppression in there, so the OKW player is going to win that engagement. Here comes the M3, but the Raketa Weapon is there. Volk squad didn't have the munitions to look, get the Faust in there, but the MG's going to try and turn. The Raketa Werfer should be turning around, and the M3 is just going to just get out of there in time, I think. No, he's still pushing in there. What's he doing? Again, very careless use of the M3. He should have, you know, he saw the he saw the Raketa Werfer was there because he had penal squads burning, so he just pushed again. He should have come around the, the top side and, and flanked him from the top, right? But he went the wrong way and you know basically threw away his M3. So really careless engagement there for the for the for the Soviet player. And, uh, you know, he just keeps throwing away his M3s, you know. His strategy isn't working for him. It worked at the start, but now, you know, he's just, he's just constantly losing his, um, you know, wasting away his units of feeding veterancy. But actually, maybe the Soviet player might actually do this with the M3s, you know, the, the, the combat engineers, actually. Reinforcements are coming, but not enough. Bulk squad over here. Needs to keep capping. This is why I'm talking about shift commands, guys. So, to, to avoid squads just being idle all the time, you want to shift cap with them. Uh, 
Uh, flamethrower needs to retreat, a bit, bit slow to retreat. He's lobbing a, he's lobbing a stun grenade there, so that stops the penal score from firing for a couple of seconds. A stern pioneer may win the engagement just about. Oh, I probably don't have to retreat there. He needs more men over there. Now, meanwhile, back at the Soviet player's base, he still hasn't teched up. He's got look at the amount of fuel in the bank that he's got. He can only call on the the the, um, the IS2 as well once he has the actual tech required. So he's he must be teching up now, surely. Also, I just want to point out that the penal that was lost early was rebuilt because he had, you know always want to try and keep him maintain a healthy kind of core infantry army, and he's and he rebuilt one of those penals that he lost, so he always want to have around about three. We do see a second Raketan in production now for our OKW player. Now that's not a bad idea because um, he knows he's behind. He's expecting T-34s soon or something like that, right? Because uh, he hasn't seen a T-70 at the moment. Also, that engineer needs to retreat right now. A bit late on the retreat there. Here comes a, another Raketan Werfer. Again, he's rushing right in against the, um, the, the Raketan Werfer. But unfortunately, the Raketan Werfer was too slow to fire. And the Volk Squad is not even trying to get in there to lob the Faust in. And look, nice little play here. He's going to jump out with the um, jump out with the uh, the Penal Squad to get the Sticky Statue onto the truck to blow it up. He doesn't get the wipe on it, but you might, you might just continue to chase it back and kill it. Little Rocket and Weapon here. But again, too late to position to set up. Oh, he does get the hit in there. Does get the finishing shot there on that, and he should be able to drive away max distance, max range here. Would have liked to see the Soviet. The Soviet player hasn't tried to counter this box squad that's just capping the whole north on its own. He could have easily chased it off with one of those M3s with a with a, with a flamethrower, but he's decided. You know, he's basically like let let him grab that whole north side for some reason. They can again. You can. Um, Take the M3 carcass and use it if he wants to. Okay, we now see two 70-70s queued up. Against this, against double Raketenwerfer. I would have gone straight to tier three, my, tier four myself. Or even made some, maybe even made some more elite infantry. Because I've noticed my opponent go double Raketenwerfer at the moment, guys. So I know he's kind of, he's expecting me to go armor. But if I keep going heavy infantry, like maybe make a guard squad or something. Or a shock trooper squad, or maybe even another penal. He's not going to be able to deal with that much infantry that I'm lobbing at him. And, and the Raketa Weapons would basically then be useless. Okay? So, and if the Schwer gets set up here and upgraded, the T-70s are going to be useless. Because the Schwer can easily fend off T-70 push. He's rebuilt mines down. Okay, and also another thing, guys. Don't ever... St after planting a mine, don't ever stand on top of your own mine. Always plant the mine and then hold down the shift key. And then click away from where you plant the mine, so your squad automatically moves away from where he plants the mine. Also, against flamethrowers, you want to be making sure your squad's spread out, so the flames don't do, do that much damage. Uh, but this is a good timing push here. So this is a very good timing push. He's like, he's like the, the Schwer is just getting set up, and the T70 can start focusing it down. Um, the MG's in a good position to suppress both these penal squads. But um, like, where's the Volk squad? So there's no infantry here. He's got one Raketan down here. He needs way more Volk squads. Uh, his, his only Volk squad's back at the base, so he has no way to snare any of these light vehicles, which allows these light vehicles to zoom past his Raketan Werfers. So, as an Axis player, and just actually, guys, just generally, with whenever you're playing, always try and have a unit that can snare near one of your anti tank guns because, you know, a, a fast vehicle like these light, light vehicles, like an M3 and T70, can easily get around behind the Raketan Werfer and make them useless. But if you manage to foust the enemy vehicle at the start of the engagement, then you'd be, your Raketan Werfer or your anti tank gun will easily be able to start fin finishing them off. Yeah. Also, uh, as Dragonif says, if you if you you know if you if you stay exactly where you are on top of the, top of where you plant the mine, it's obvious that you've planted a mine there because the squad, whenever they plant a mine, they go into like a a, a square shape, which is obvious that they've planted a mine in that location. That's fair. But the uh, he's being very careless, and so he's too busy micring his vehicles over here, and he's just lost both his penal squads over here. So he's very bad multitasking here. He might lose this uh, pink stern pioneer squad here. Oh, he managed to get the Raketan Weapon on that L angle there. Does lose the, um, does lose the, uh, the Spur. Ox squad's retreating back. Raketan Weapon there, still in position to get shot in. Nope. Decides to retreat. Now, imagine if you had one Volk squad here, 
this would not have this would have been a big massive win for the OKW player, but because he didn't have any bulk squads here to, to get the Fausts in to stop these C70s running right, he's gonna lose he lost his fur, he's losing his Rakette and Werfer, and he's been in serious trouble now. A good 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 maneuver here though to push forward with his sweeper to, to make sure that he's, he's clearing up the mines. I mean, it might have even been worthwhile to, like... I don't know if he's, he's going to go mechanize now to try and get Puma out, I think. I mean, that's that's what he could realistically do now. T-70's running north now. This is a good play here to run north with the T-70s because he knows his, his opponent was trying to cap north. And with the T-70s, he probably could, like, start wiping the squads on retreat. But he's also using the T-70 um, uh, ability secure mode to decap the resources on this side. Now look here. Look at the resources in the OKW player. Instantly get halved because he's used the T-70 there to cut off the resources. Uh, very nice little play there. Um, but we'll see here. We see have a third T-70 on the way. But we do, like, both Rakettans have been re -crewed. So I don't, again, I'm not really sure about, you know, keep going for T-70s when he probably just go for an IS-2 and just finish the game off. Um, especially because he's likely got not got much infantry left. He's rebuilt one of the penal squads. Yeah, a Puma with a couple of volt, you know, it's going to be really hard to make these T-70s work, so. He's also popped on the, uh, he spent some munitions to repair that T-70 back to full health. He's going to be able to also now to um, salvage these resources. So, you know those T-70s came in here and, put, and killed all this stuff? They should have came back over here and then wiped these wrecks because these are this is munitions, like, you know, like I was saying. This is fuel that the OKW player is getting so he can get his Puma out faster to try and counter these T-70s. We are losing supplies to the enemy. So, these stems are veterans force, so they're going to do a lot of work here. But they... Oh, we might even wipe this guy. So, I don't know what it is about Artem, but he's incredibly bad at retreating his squads in time. He keeps losing, he keeps forgetting about his squads. Here comes another T-70 over here. Needs to be vet five sterns. Needs to be very careful. He's trying to plot a mine, but the Raketan weapons are there. One's coming in from the flank. He decides to just retreat. But again, where are the Volks Grenadiers? Like, Again, the OKW player needs his snares. If he had snares there, he didn't have to retreat all his units there. Now he's just going to get chased all the way back to base. He needs to have his infantry supporting his Raketan workers. These C-70s just can just kill everything now in the base. Uncontested. We do have a Puma coming out. Also, that's why I always recommend maybe putting a mine on your flank route and your base entrances. Now, you try to put down two mines over here, but... You know... However, the T-70 player also needs to be careful now because he should be expecting a, um, you know, some armor, you know, or maybe another Raketan coming out soon. He's staying in the base. He is retreating one of the Volk squads to come back and help, but it's too, you know, could have been easily prevented here. That Volk squad can easily recruit these Raketans, so it's not a massive loss for the OKW player, but still, it's just like real care, really careless play. No mines to protect his base entrance. Stop that base push. Um, yeah. Also, there's lots of um, PTOS rifles on the ground here, so it might even be worth building another Volk squad just to recrew. Uh, sorry, just to pick up these two PTOS rifles, so he has a unit that can, you know, they can do some decent damage against these T-70s. You know, um, he's also floating a lot of manpower as well. He's going to be making another raket weapon, which is a big no-no. He already has two, which I think is fine. Um, I definitely would recommend maybe getting another Volk squad. Um, you know, especially with this many T-70s that he's dealing with. And again, I really did, don't agree with this mass T-70 build from this uh, Soviet player, Artyom. You should definitely have teched up. Because this, this again, these, these, this play only lasts, only works for so long. Because, you know, a, 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 a well micro Puma and maybe a couple of Rakettans, you know, as soon as, soon as like, these, like a couple of these T-70s die, the game is going to immediately switch into favor of the OKW player. He's going to try and make a big push here and both Rakettans are setting up. He's now got his Volk squad there. Hopefully this time to support. But he needs to be very careful. This penal score with PTS rifles does not get a sticky satchel on him. He does get suppressed. Here comes the T-70 blob. They're going to push right in here. The Ketan Werfers are... Oh. Again, not set up. Where's the Volk squads again? Where is the Volk squads to get the Fausts off? They're not there. Again. At least he's put a mine down this time to help. 
Oh damn. And he's not he's, he's not focused on the uh, the machine gun over there. The machine gun's getting taken down. But actually this Puma still could just probably pick off all of these T-70s quite easily. It goes two po two T-70s down. And um you know, he, three Raketans were wiped, but he can still just recruit them. So it's not a massive loss, really, you know? Now he's being too aggressive with his Puma. He needs to reverse him back immediately so he doesn't get sticky satcheled. And I don't know why Artyom is not trying to recruit any of these anti-tank guns. Like, if he recruits them, it stops his opponent using them. Right, here we go. Now he's going to recruit them. So, you know, it's always good to recruit. Now he can also use the um, anti-tank guns to destroy these wrecks if he wants to. So again, like what I was saying earlier, stop your opponent salvaging to get fuel. He's going for another Puma. This is such a weird game. I just want to see more, like... Getting another Puma out. Still no, no Tier 4 from our, uh, from our Soviet player. Okay, that was a good play there by using a, a, a satchel charge to blow up that Raketan weapon. So he stole one and denied one. So that's a nice play there to stop his opponent from utilizing that. More T-70s coming out. It's double Puma. This Puma can literally just chase these T-70s down, but he needs to be careful. He hasn't, you know, he, he could be running into a mine here with his T-70, with his Puma, sorry. He's not checking. I mean, he could push these guys forward to spot for mines going forward here, but he's, you know, he's not doing that for some reason. He needs to cancel these mines and start reinforce, um, damaging these wrecks. So if I was this Soviet player right now, what I would do is get tier four built, make, you know, save up for that IS-2. Um, and maybe make another penal squad and just try and, you know, bite out these Pumas and see if I can get some sticky satchels on them and blow them up. Because I feel like the, actually the OKW player is in, in a better spot. Even with all these um, pushes and successful wipes from this Soviet player, I feel like the OKW player does have the better army, but he just never uses his Volk squads. I mean, this, I mean he's playing well here, though, planting mines, because he knows his opponent keeps rushing in with those C70s, right? So he's preparing for that. But he definitely needs to keep maybe a second Volk squad over here so he can get the Faust in. But yeah, he just keeps making these T-70s. I don't, these things are not going to... You know, this next push is definitely not going to work. Now, look, you know, the OKW player has definitely put more mines down than before. And he's now got a second Puma. He's rebuilt another Raketenwerfer. Enemy forces capturing supply sector. Taking fire! There's a lot of, of sticky... Um, incendiary nade here. So that Raketenwerfer has to get out. Okay, at least he's pushing forward with Sweeper here, so he spotted this mine here. But he hasn't pushed forward the Sweeper down here to spot these mines. So he's going to run right into another mine here. Boom. And the Pumas are there ready, instantly ready to start wrecking these T-70s. Look, very nice play there. See how effective those mines were? Instantly. And another mine gets hit. He just needs that Volk squad to bounce the other, the healthy one. But you see, like, you know, that all could have been avoided if he just pushed forward with the sweepers and made sure that was so careful. He's going to get Sticky Satchel here. There goes the Sticky Satchel. I don't think it will wipe that Puma, but it'll bring it quite low. MG does get just decrewed and probably wiped there. Not a good play there. But yeah, like, he lost, like, two of those T-70s immediately because he didn't push forward with the sweepers, right? So that's why I'm talking about mines. And actually, one of the third, the third T-70 went down because it hit a mine as well. And that all, like I said, all could have been avoided through just making sure the sweeper was there, right? He spotted one of those mines, but he had it over here. Should have checked more, more further, further down. The squad of pioneers has arrived. Still no tier four here. Fast forward this a little bit now. Our territory is falling into enemy hands. Resistance must have been locked. A sector has been cut off. Right, he's getting his spare up finally, but it's going to be a long time. Right, he's going to get some Falschemjägers in, okay? I mean, Falschemjägers is going to be quite nice. Because he's got munitions there to Faust. He's also got munitions to uh, maybe upgrade those Falschemjägers with, uh, with an upgrade. He's going to bring the Pumas around and try and deal with this T-70. And again, he's not checking for... Um, that was a really nice pick there from the Pumas, but again, he didn't push forward with the sweepers. Like, he could have upgraded them with sweepers and checked for mine, because there could have been a Soviet mine there, right? And that those, those Pumas would have been trouble, especially against the PTRS conscripts. So, you know, the wasted T-70 there, and more mines definitely need to be applied by a Soviet player. 
He's hardly put any down this entire game. No, no mines here on his on his on his on his through points on his on his on the roads and stuff. So you know, but this this Okie Dobby player will probably win this this battle. I think, even though he's he's he, you know he's playing so poorly as well. Have fallen to 300. Yeah, the fact that he's lost up on those on those raquettes is going to be really annoying for those Pumas. The Pumas are going to have a difficult time to try and try and do well here. Yeah, he needs to like the OKW player needs to try and flank around the side here or around the top here to try and deal with this position. I mean, he could use one Puma around the side here and another Puma around the side here and try and take out that T70. This is quite risky to repair that T70 on the front line like that because the OKW player might have decided to push. He's on negative cover there. Need to be careful. Oh, but there's Penals. Oh, why not? He retreated. Oh, he retreated too early then. At least he's bringing the Pumas around. This is a nice little flank though. I like this. He's coming around the side here where his opponent is not expecting. He pulled back because he saw the Raketan Weather face that way. Now he needs to push him from his base side. But he's going to just push against it. Now what's he doing? He lobs smoke over there for some reason. I'm not sure why that was about. Enemy forces are neutralizing a sector. Okay, he's popping healing. Here comes another T70 out from the base. He could Faust in. He's going to get the Faust in. Uh oh, but that retreat path for those Fulchamigas is going to get them killed. Fulchamigas go down. We might lose the veteran C3 penals if he's not careful. And he's burning it using the flame through to burn out the house. It's a nice play here. Double sterns though, close quarters, gonna do a lot of damage. Again, they've got a nasty retreat path. Where's the where's one of the Pumas at? You know, this C70 could just chase these guys back to base uncontested. Alright, what are we gonna see here? Still no tier 4 for some reason. What's the point of choosing this commander if you're not even gonna pick half the abilities on it? Oh, he's going to call in an, uh, a second Fulcrum Rigger squad. He lost his first. I definitely feel like both, both sides here. Like, I wouldn't be calling in elite infantry guys when you don't have much infantry in general. I would rebuild. Always try and rebuild to have a core infantry army. So as OKW, always try and have at least three Volk squads, right? Um, just so you can have more flank, you know, more units capping, more, you know, more units that can snare and lob and incendiary grenades. In investing in high expensive units like Fulcrum Rigger's when you have hardly any units anyway is just not a good idea. Maybe having one is okay, but, you know, like he's got 500, 600 manpower in the bank right now, this OKW player. He needs to be building more units. Let's talk about, again, the Soviet player. Soviet player, again, he keeps making more T-70s. It's not working for him. You know, he keeps losing them. He needs to just tech up. Because, you know, an IS-2 is going to easily just shrug off the, the, pom the Poma rounds. Oh, he's trying to rush in here. Thinks better off it. That's a good play, you know. He decided to think better off it because he knew he was going to get snared there. Falls back. He's going to get repaired. He has. He needs to upgrade his, his repair pioneers on his on his fur. But here he's going. He's doing a good play here. He's pulling back his units. Well, actually, no. He needs to have the. You know, he could be capping that fuel point and repairing at the same time. By the way, guys, and he's not doing that. So that's a, that's a bad play there. I thought he was going to do that, but he's not. Always try and you know do multiple things at once if you can. Oh, so this is a good play here. The Stern Pioneers have got a long retreat back and the T-70 is getting on the retreat path. Pumas are not, that Puma is not going north to try and help the C-70 retreat back. And that Vection C-5 Stern Pioneer gets picked up there. Because again, it was unsupported. Very painful to lose that Vection C unit. And more T-70s, Jesus Christ. Okay, he's got two full Shemegas now. Both Pumas on Tibet 2. Finally putting his own mines down, which is nice. Again, I don't... His fascination with making two Stern Pioneers all the time. Oh, nice pick. Could have Fausted. Oh, he's going to get Sticky Satchel. Oh, wow. And now these C-70s are free to kill everything on the retreat bar. That was really bad there. So 
What happened there was for the OKW player was he let one of his Pomas get sticky satcheled and he didn't use the, his range advantage of the Pomas, right? The Pomas outranged the T70s and he let the T70s just fire at them from, from close range. So he should have had that Puma come from the side here, pick that one and the other one come round the bottom here and fire max range because I thought that was an engagement that was going to easily be one for the OKW player. But again, you know, again, he didn't foul. So again, no foul sin against these units. Uh, no mines again on his retreat path. So these T70s can just just cause, cause havoc. Uh, it's just looking terrible. But though the, 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 the Soviet player is also very bad because he always forgets about his infantry when he micros his T-70s. Like he's gonna lose his Vector C2 penal now because he's too busy microing his penals. And also, he could have picked up those Fulcher Migas easily on retreat and he didn't chase them back. And now this, uh, now this uh, Okanabi player needs to be very careful. He's doing the right thing here, trying to hide the Fulcher Migas before those T-70s come and try and get him on the retreat path. You know? Because that Fulcher Trigger Sword would definitely die. But he's going to try and move and maybe push over here and spot them. Oh no, he revealed himself! Oh no, they're dead. They're going to get picked up and retreat now. Oh, they're dead Fulcher Yeah. Fast forward this game. The enemy is encroaching on our territory. I mean, it's nice that he's got the he's, he's got the and Werfer and the MG like positioned with each other, so they're supporting each other, which is very nice. And he's got it, and they've also he's got it overlaying onto that middle that that, that VP that the, the, the cutoff, right? So he's trying to make sure his partner doesn't get the cutoff. And he's using the T70 cap. And guess what? He built another T70. He needs to be flanking in from the top while the, you know, this MG's focusing on this squad here. Now would be a good time to flank in from this side, but he's too busy going pushing north. Okay, we do still have a Panzer IV in production now. Might actually bring him back into this game. He's only got to worry about one Rakete worth really. As long as he doesn't get sticky statues, he should be fine here. But again, I can't believe the, 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 um, okay. Like, this Soviet player could have won the game half an hour ago, or well, 15 minutes ago, if he had just gone for the IS-2. Like, period. Like, wait. Enemy are okay, we're going to have to get some nice shots in here. That MG's going to get pinned because it's got, you know... Here comes the Panzer IV to support. The Rocket is there. And he runs right in to get Sticky Satchel. That is the worst thing he could have done. Oh, my God. Wow. Right. <laughs> that was, that's, this is exactly, it's like literally the, wor the worst thing you can do is charge, like you know your opponent's got a Rakettenwerfer, is charge right down the front line, right at where he's got all his support units, and lose it. Right? You needed to have, I mean, but good play from the Soviet player though, because he has, like, he's got his penal squad there to get the, to get the snare in, and the Rakettenwerfer there as well to try and smack, to get, the, to get the unit as well. So that's good, you know, good support, like all these units are supporting each other, trying to hold the line, right? So, a very nice play for the Soviet player to have, you know, these units in conjunction. This is what the OKW player should have done, right? If he had his Rakettens with Volk's support, Lord support, he would have done a lot better. But you see here, he had the snare, he had the AT support, easy win, easy quick, quick kill on the Panzer IV, which did fuck all, right? Now, however, the OKW, the Ostia player is now building, so the Soviet player is now building an SU-76 for some reason. Why would you do that? You know you're ahead, you've just killed the, the only armor he had. Don't make an SU-76. That's a terrible idea. You need to be making more anti-infantry things. He needs to tech up and get tier 4 down. Hell, even more T-70s. If he's gonna, you know, it would be better than making an SU-76 right now. But again, look, same problem here. OKW, OKW player is not learning from his mistakes. He's again pushing in one of, one of his units to the north, trying to cap up. And again, he's got no mines. He's got, yeah, he's got no mines on his retreat path. So these T-70s can once more chase this squad all the way back to base and kill him. You could set up such a nice ambush, like, like for these for these T-70s, right? No mines here again. Enemy forces are capturing our supplies. And right in the base. Gonna we'll try and get the Faust there. Not paying attention to his full Shimiga squad here. 
Really not sure we made that. There we go. He's capping up there. So good use of the T70s to cap up the resources, the, the, the territory while the, you know while no combat's happening. He should actually he should know there's a squad down here because it capped the VP. So he should bring his T70s down to the south and try and wipe this squad like he did before with the with the, with the stone pioneers in the top. T70. So this is a mistake here, he's not paying attention. He could turn the T70 into fire mode and try and... It's special C3, so it should easily pick up that M MG. And he's not doing that, so a big mistake there to not do that. He does do it now, but a bit too late. The MG's already gone past him. And he's not chasing it either. So another, another mistake there. Well, that T70... I mean, those raketten weapons are a nice, nice tasty spot to, to maybe snag that T70 here. One more shot and a Faust. That's a dead T70. There you go, look. Easy. See, see, see how easy it is when you have a vault nearby, right? And he's got a mine that's not built there either. And then, like again, like he has sweepers available. He could he could sweep these mines, and he just hit it with his face. Always push, always push forward with sweepers to spot for mines. He's gonna push for those raketons, hopefully to help get that T70. His squads all bunched up there, so the T70 is gonna be doing a lot of damage to both those squads because they're both together. But you can see how effective the T70 is once he gets efficiency through. Like, it just smashes squads. Look. And this poor Volk squad, uh, uh, Fulcherminger squad. He's got his rear armor facing the Schwer, which is not good. That T70 needs to watch out. The enemy has 75 points remaining. You appear suited for command. There's still a machine gun. Good, good, good idea to pick the machine gun up. Could have used shift retreat then to retreat immediately as soon as he picked that up. Don't know why he's focusing that barbed wire that he built beginning of the game and again look he's he finally got upgraded put, put made sure his sweeper upgrade was on but he just freaking kept on smashing mine smash mine smash mine we'll hit by mine there let's sweep that one there and that machine gun just in range there So they're chasing him all the way back to the base, getting his engineer there to sweep the mines. Three goddamn tank guns, Jesus. And let's fast forward a little bit more. The sector is at risk. He's finally built tier four, Jesus. And also he's floating a load of resources and he's nowhere near pop cap. So he can definitely build the IS-2 and he also can call on another unit as well. So he probably should build another unit now. I'd build a third penal or something now. Get very max to the third penal or something. Cause finally, you know, as soon as this IS-2 comes out, he's gonna win the game immediately, right? It's just silly. The enemy is taking what we have secured. Where are the raketten weapons to support the Fulcher Mega push here? They, they get pushed back. Oh, now the raketten weapon shows up. But now the raketten weapons are unsupported. So now the infantry can push in against the raketten weapons and clean them up. So, right. Here comes the IS-2 finally. Could have come out 20 minutes ago easily. And now he just needs to push in with both T-70s and the IS-2 chart leading the way so it can take the, take, uh, tank the first shots of the, of the raketten weapons. Um, but I don't know what he's waiting for. I mean, he knows you can win in 50 VP, so he just needs to sit here, actually, and just hold this middle VP. Oh, but he hasn't got the top VP, so he's actually not not uh, draining his opponent right now. So every bit he delays, it allows his opponent to come back into the game. He's not attacking, he's just sitting there. Why are you not pushing? Finish your opponent off. The opponent's going to get his Panzer IV out now. Probably going to throw it away again, though. Oh, right, here we go. He's going to push now. Pushing more with the IS-2 first. He's using... This is a good play. He's, 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 he's popping on... The combat mode of his um, of his T70, he, he only needs to do it on one. I don't know why he's got it on both, but 
he could put it on the veteran C3 to give himself some vision. And then, um, you know, the other one, T70, could be, could be helping. Because he's giving himself vision there to spot for those Raketten Werpers. And another freaking Fulchimiga comes out. He's got all his fancy tankers in the same spot as well. This is going to be horrible, man. They're all going to get... Oh. All right, slow this down a bit. All right, he's taking out the SG-76. Uh, this is a good play. He's using his L2 Sturmovic as well to help him out to try and wipe these anti-tank gun crews. That's quite nice. He's not retreating that engineer squad, though. Panzer IV is being used against the T-70, though. That's a good play. He's got his rear armor showing against the T-70, so the T-70 is actually penetrating that. It. There's the enemy Raketten Werfer going to get one round in, in the back. He's trying to reactivate Blitzkrieg, but it's going to be too little too late. Ice 2 gets the last shot in. Panzer 4 goes down. MG in the house there. Focusing on the wrong thing. He needs to pay attention to his infantry, though. You see what I mean? As soon as the IS-2 comes out, right? Easy win. And that's GG. Yep. But yeah, there you go. So that game was pretty, like, I would not recommend a play like this um, to anyone. But hopefully you guys learned something from watching this game. Because the things I'm pointing out, why, the, why they're doing these things, and that's why it's not a good idea to do these things. Um, so again, like, you know, for the OKW player's point of view, he needed his Volk squads there to support his anti-tank guns. If he had those Volk squads there earlier on, um, he would have been able to deal with those T-70 pushes a lot easier. And the Soviet player, I mean, you know, his infantry play was poor. He kept on losing squads all the time whenever he was microing his vehicles. So he just needs to learn a bit multitask a little bit better, make sure he's retreating his squads. Um, always, guys, pay attention to the top right-hand side of your monitor to retreat squads. Um, and, uh, yeah. Hey guys, thank you for watching that video. If you want more content, please click on the link over here and over here. If you would like to subscribe, click on the button down here. Also click on the notification bell down there so you're notified whenever I post new YouTube content. I also stream nearly every single day on Twitch. Uh, I have a Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash helpinghands. Uh, and if you want to show your support there, please do subscribe uh, as all your support helps me do this full time. And uh, yeah, guys, I appreciate it as always and catch you next time. Bye-bye.